Okay, so let's begin the third day of our dark energy session. And the first talk it will be by Professor Emmanuel Seridakis, Soft Dark Energy and Soft Dark Matter. Please. Okay, thank you, Alexei, very much for the introduction. And thank you, David, for giving me the opportunity to give this talk. Um, so very briefly, we are going to talk on soft dark energy and soft uh, uh, dark matter. And this work is based on a recent paper that I did and another paper that's going to archive, uh, to appear in archive uh, very soon on the observational confrontation of this scenario. And actually, the basic idea is that we examine the possibility of soft cosmology, which means the, the possibility that the universe dark sectors exhibit uh, soft matter properties. Now, as you know, standard cosmology, of course, is very efficient qualitatively and quantitatively in describe the universe both at the buffer round and at the perturbation level. However, since cosmology now has become an accurate science and will have a huge amount of data, people are uh, investigating various extensions and modifications of uh, the coordinates model in order to try to solve the various tensions that arise here and there. Of course, uh, you are all familiar with the, the huge uh, number of models that appear that usually people assume extra fluids, fields, extra sectors, or modifications of, of gravity. However, there is a strong assumption in all of these extensions. And this assumption is that the universe fluids behave as hard matter. So one can uh, uh, apply the hydrodynamics and thermodynamics of usual hard matter. However, in condensed matter physics, um, people know, and uh, there have been uh, many, many hundreds of papers in a new form of matter called soft matter. Now, soft matter is characterized by complexity, simultaneous coexistence of phase, uh, uh, viscoelasticity, so it's both viscous and elastic, extreme sensitivity. So in general, the characteristic of soft matter is that due to uh, complexity, there appear effective interactions at intermediate scales that are not present at the fundamental scales. Now, Although there is not a clear definition of what is soft matter, the best definition that we have is that soft matter is the one that has the properties of soft materials. Now, examples of soft materials are the polymers like plastic, rubber, etc., the colloids like milk, ice cream, the soft cracktons, granular materials, liquid crystal gels, and biological matter. We are made from soft matter. DNA, viruses, etc. Now, although these materials are very different from each other, they have some common properties. And these properties are complexity. As I told you already, we have the appearance of, of new structure at intermediate scales due to interactions that are not prevent, present at the fundamental scales. Coexistence of phase, and this is something really basic. So the same material, has a different equation of state depending on the scale that you are looking on it. So you can have a material that at the same time can be fluid at small scales and solid at large scales. And of course, the other properties that I mentioned. So we examine the possibility that the dark sectors of the universe, since we don't know the microphysics of dark energy and dark matter, exhibit intrinsically or effectively soft matter properties. And I mentioned here that this analysis holds both in general relativity and in modified theories of gravity. It's completely independent. So let me very briefly summarize standard cosmology. So of course, you start with the cosmological principle, the universe is homogeneous and isotropic, and this allows you to impose the FRW metric. Concerning the sectors of the universe, we consider all standard model of particle physics. So baryonic matter and radiation. And we also impose dark matter and dark energy. Now for dark matter, we don't know the microphysics of it. It can be a particle or particles 
or it can have an effective origin from black holes or from uh, modified gravity. And again, from the dark, uh, for the dark energy sector, we don't know the microphysics of that. And uh, you are all familiar with the, the, the huge number of models that assume various fields and fluids uh, or modifications of gravity. Now, a basic assumption is that the cosmological scales are suitably large in order to allow one to use the effective hydrodynamic description. So we neglect the microphysical Lagrangian and we just write the energy momentum tensor for the energy fluids. At least we are doing that after a particular stage of the universe evolution. At earlier stage, you should, uh, of course, apply the Boltzmann equation and you take into account the, the microphysics. But in general, in, in late time cosmology, we, we, we consider just uh, the universe fluids. At the background level, these are the two Friedman equations. And of course, the conservation equations in the case of non-interactive cosmology gives you the usual conservation equations. Of course, you can go to interacting cosmology uh, through the phenomenological descriptor of the interaction, this QY. And the final assumption is that these fluids have an equation of state parameter uh, of a barotropic type. And this model can go, this cosmology in general, can go back to lambda CDM if the dark energy fluid is the cosmological constant. Now, at the perturbation level, I will focus on scalar perturbation just for simplicity uh, around the 4W background. So we assume this standard form. And these are the perturbation equations for the overdensity, the density contrast of the various fluids. And uh, theta here is the divergence of the fluid velocity. Of course, here, as you know, this uh, sound speed effective square determines the, the clustering of this sector. So if this is zero, it means clustering. If this is one, it means no clustering. And W is the equation of state parameter. And in general, we can have the Poisson equation at sub-horizon scales given by this expression. Now, in the literature, you can find, of course, many variations of this a framework and you can have extra assumptions. However, there is a crucial assumption, namely that the universe fluids are hard matter. We are going to examine the possibility of soft cosmology so that dark energy and or dark matter have effectively or intrinsically properties of soft matter. So starting from soft dark energy, we are going to consider the case that dark energy has a particular equation of state at large scales. So at scales entering the Friedman equations, so the scales that determine the background evolution of the universe. But dark energy is allowed to have a different value of equation of state parameter at intermediate scales. So at scales entering the perturbation equations and at least at sub-horizon level, they determine the large scale structure and of course the CMB um, uh, phenomenology. So in order to phenomenologically do that, we introduce the softness parameter. So this S of dark energy, softness parameter of dark energy. So this means that if at large scales, so at the Friedman equation level, dark energy has an equation of state parameter W of dark energy, large scales. So this is the usual thing that we're using. On small and intermediate scales, so at scale centering the sub-horizon perturbation equations, dark energy is going to have a different equation of state. This is a basic property of soft matter that at the same time, we have coexistence of phases. On large scales, it can be a solid. On small scales, it can be a liquid. So standard cosmology is reobtained when this effective uh, softness parameter is equal to 1. But we allow the possibility this to, de to deviate slightly from 1, which means that dark energy has a different equation state at large scale and intermediate scale. 
And the same can go for soft dark matter. So again, if you allow for the softness parameter of dark matter, this SDM, it means that dark matter can have one equation of state at large scale, so at scale centering the Friedman equations, and a different equation of state at smaller scales. Mind the difference here of the parameterization just to avoid to handle the, the fact that uh, dark, um, dark matter is dust. So it's, it's zero. So you cannot multiply with zero. I mentioned here that dark matter can be uh, soft even if effectively, even if dark energy is not soft due to dark energy clustering. You see, we have the appearance of, of structure at intermediate levels. So if you have two dark matter pieces, if you have a cluster of dark energy between them, they are going to, to feel a different effective gravitational um, attraction than two dark matter uh, clusters that are not uh, that do not have um, a dark energy cluster between them. So for dark energy, the softness behavior can be intrinsic, but for dark matter, it can be effective, even if there is nothing uh, special. So let me start going to the results. So here you can see we focus on the F sigma eight. And you know the, the famous F sigma eight tension that there seems to be less uh, clustering in, in, in the universe than predicted by lambda CDM. So the dust line here is the lambda CDM prediction. And here the solid line is our prediction if we allow for slightly softness parameter in the dark energy sector. So we allow for softness parameters 1.1. So this means that the background level of our model is completely equivalent with lambda CDM. So W of dark energy at large scales is minus one and dark matter is dust. However, at small scales, phenomenologically, we impose dark energy to have slightly different equation of state and being equal to minus 1.1. So because the properties of soft matter is extreme sen sensitivity, you can see that even very uh, small um, softness parameter is able to solve the F sigma eight tension. Similarly for soft dark matter. So here we are playing exactly the same game the dust line here is the uh, question of, of um, uh, is the, the results of lambda CDM. And the solid line here is the results of our model. The background level is completely equivalent with lambda CDM, but at intermediate uh, scales, we assume that dark matter deviates a little bit from dust and it has an equation of state parameter equals to 0 0.05. So let me repeat, dark matter at the background level is completely dust with zero equation of state, but at intermediate scales, we leave it to be a little bit different. This is a property of soft matter. It has a different equation of state on different scales. So we are going to consider many models, of course, models where only soft dark energy uh, exists, only soft dark matter or both soft dark energy or soft dark matter. And again, concerning the background level, you can assume lambda CDM cosmology or you can assume um, other dark energy parameterization like the uh, Sevaye polaski linde parameterization, the CPL. Soft cosmology just takes the, the usual background cosmology that you choose but it changes the equation of state at uh, smaller scales. So these are the results. These are going to appear in archive, uh, I hope, in uh, uh, next week. So we are using data from uh, uh, baryonic acoustic oscillations and, uh, and supernova and also CMB. And as you can see, the important quantity to fit is this softness parameter. So here is model one, only soft dark energy. So we have lambda CDM at the background level. So the background level remains completely the same with standard cosmology. 
but at the, at the clustering level, at the perturbation equation, we assume a different, a slightly different equation of state parameter for dark energy. And this is quantified by the softness parameter. As you can see, the softness parameter of dark energy is consistent with the value one, which is standard cosmology, but soft dark energy is slightly favored. And here you can see the results. Again, the effective um, softness parameter is slight. One is marginally inside the one sigma region. So standard cosmology is inside, <coughs> but there is a favor towards soft uh, values. <coughs> this is a model where we have only soft dark matter. And again, the, the parameter, the softness parameter of dark matter is favored to be not one. So this means that the background level is lambda CDM, but so dark matter is dust, but at the intermediate perturbation level, we allow the softness parameter of dark matter to deviate uh, from one. And indeed the data seem to show that this is uh, favored. And again, here is, are the results, the one and two sigma results. So the parameter, uh, the softness parameter of dark matter is favored to be not exactly one. And this is the third model where we allow for both soft dark energy and dark matter. So in this case, again, the background cosmology is lambda CDM exactly. There is no deviation at the background level. But at the perturbation level, so at the clustering level, we allow for soft dark energy and soft dark matter, which means we allow for a dark energy equation state parameter deviating from minus one, and for dark matter equation state parameter deviating from zero. And as you can see, the contour plots seems to favor soft cosmology. And these are again the results that you can see the bound in dark energy and dark matter. And just let me show you an example. In, in soft matter materials, the clustering of soft matter uh, changes, of course, because we have different intermediate complex interactions. As you can see here on the left, we, we present the clustering of soft material. This corresponds to colloids of gold uh, nanoparticles. And the fractal dimension of this uh, clustering is 1.75. Here is, a, is a, the well-known galaxy redshift survey of the galaxy clustering. And again, you can calculate the fractal dimension here, which is more or less on the same ground. So this is just a qualitative argument that the clustering behaviors of soft materials are very interesting. So since we uh, uh, don't know the microphysics of dark matter and dark energy, we could consider the, the possibility that they are uh, soft. They have slightly soft properties. So let me conclude. Again, intrinsically or effectively, since we don't know the microphysics of dark matter and dark energy, we can assume that they are slightly soft. So this means that at the background level, they behave in the usual way, but at the perturbation level, they have a different equation of state parameter. This is the basic feature of soft matter. It has different equation of state simultaneously on different scales. So although the background evolution remains unaffected, even slight corrections were uh, adequate to solve the F sigma eight tension and confrontation with observations from BAO, supernova and CMB uh, seems to favor soft cosmology. Perhaps this could be helpful in order to solve the Karspic halo problem and the dwarf, the missing uh, satellite galaxy problem that uh, is a problem of standard collisionless uh, dark matter. But of course, in order to incorporate complexity and estimate the different equation of state from first principle, we should revise the standard and extend the standard cosmological theory and perform a detailed uh, mesoscopic statistical mechanical analysis. So that's it. 
I thank you very much. And just uh, to make an announcement uh, in this uh, September in Corfu uh, for our cost problem uh, programs on cosmology and gravity, we are organizing conferences and school uh, with financial support. So you are all welcome uh, to join. So thank you very much. I stop here. Well, thank you, Emmanuel, uh, for this interesting talk. Mm. We have time for one e question. Emmanuel, uh, yes, yes, I'm here. Uh, stop sharing the screen. Okay, okay. I'll stop it. Any questions? Any question? <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Maybe just a very quick question. Okay, uh, is there an overlap with uh, uh, taking a scale dependent bias? Very good question. Well, okay. In, in, for some cases, there could be, but in general, this is an independent kind of because you can you can you have a very rich uh, possibilities to play with. So you can assume that this scale is also scale dependent or time dependent or if you if you assume modified gravity on top of that again you have another weapon to obtain uh, scale dependent interactions so in general this is uh, this is more general okay thank you okay uh, thank you Emmanuel, thank you very much more. let's now go to, to the second talk by professor mm, uh, our our Rillian Ibarau. So it will be okay about seven plant. Okay, let me read the more. Classifying string theory with telescopes or on the decided seven plant conjecture. Please. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity. So my talk is not at all uh, designed for string theorists, but it's really for cosmologists trying to take a kind of observational viewpoint on this uh, theoretical question, if we, if we can say. So um, as we all know, uh, string theory replaces point particles by one dimensional vibrating objects. This led to a kind of new paradigm. And uh, impressively, the gravitons, so namely a uh, massless spin to boson, is uh, somehow predicted by the fundamental quantum uh, excitations of the strings. So this is uh, extremely tantalizing. But as we also all know, uh, the, the price to pay is very high because we need for symmetry at a certain scale. We need extra dimensions, and so on and so forth. So I would say that at this point, probably string theory is less a very well-defined axiomatic theory than a kind of framework with interesting consequences or applications in condensed matter physics, in mathematics, in cosmology, in black holes, in nuclear physics, and so on and so forth. Of course, from the viewpoint of a usual physicists, the main issue is about falsifiability because it has been said many times that basically anything happening in nature could be accounted by string theory. So is it still science, at least in the usual Popperian uh, sense? Well, probably it's a kind of unfair trial because many unsuccessful tests were suggested for string theory. But what is new now, I think, and what is exciting for us cosmologists is that it might be that very large scale and very low energy physics could be very useful in putting uh, string theory under strong pressure. So I'm going to focus on the future observatories. So there are Rubin, SKA, and Euclid, and try to understand how they could help us maybe falsifying string theory. So the main uh, setting is the so-called Schwamplan program. So string theory might be unique, but as we once again all know, its vacua are not just because of the generalized magnetic fluxes and because, of course, of the very numerous Calabi-Yau um, geometrical configurations. 
This was understood as the landscape of effective low energy theories, which is not necessarily a failure in itself, because in the framework of the multiverse, it's even possible to make predictions within this framework that are extremely complicated, of course, to check because we don't know the entropic way, because we don't know the appropriate measure, and so on and so forth. But at still, it remains somehow within the framework of standard science. But what now is new and probably very interesting is that the size of this landscape of theories might have been completely overestimated because probably most of the so-called landscape is actually a swampland, which means a space of theories that seems compatible with string theory, but which actually, when understood better, are not. So the, 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 the problem generally arises when those theories are coupled to gravity. So the, the usual way to understand this situation is to use it as a guide for model building. If you build a model which lives in the swampland, it looks like appropriate quantum field theory. But when taking into account those arguments, you might end up with the um, understanding that it is not and that you should change your model. So the viewpoint I'm taking here is different. Let's assume that the real world, which probably is correct by definition, right, lives there in the swampland then it would mean probably not that the world is wrong, but that the, 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 the paradigm of the swampland is wrong, and therefore that maybe string theory is wrong. This is the main um, idea. So to be uh, slightly more specific, you begin with a theory which, uh, which seems to live in the landscape, and you increase energy. At uh, some point, there is a new scale called the swampland scale, uh, above which the theory has to be modified to converge to this quantum gravity point, which is associated, of course, with the gravitational scale. So um, what is interesting is when this swampland scale is small enough. If the swampland scale is above the quantum field theory scale, that's not very exciting. But if the swampland scale is so low that all the other scales of the theory are above it, it basically means that the whole model lives in the swampland, and therefore we have a problem. So at this stage, uh, the swampland program is an ensemble of conjectures. Some are very reliable. They are theorems, at least in the string theory framework, of course. And others are simple guesses with a very weak fundamental uh, understanding. So I won't go, of course, into all the details. I'm going to focus on the so-called Dusseter conjecture, which basically states that it is not possible to resemble too much a Dusseter state. That, that is a pure um, cosmological, a pure positive cosmological constant in Einstein's field equation. So why so? Uh, in uh, Einstein gravity, uh, it seems not very uh, complicated to change to flip the sign of lambda. So why should negative lambda uh, exist and not uh, a positive lambda? Well, there the, the, the are very different arguments. At this stage, there is no theorem. There are many different understandings. First one is related with supersymmetry, because uh, fundamental supersymmetry uh, symmetries are not compatible with a pure de Sitter state. There are these um, uh, anti de Sitter uh, conformal field theory arguments that cannot be extended to the Sitter space, at least in a rigorous sense. There are stability issues. There are lifetime issues because you expect that when the internal volume of the extra dimensions goes to infinity, the potential goes to zero, and therefore it is just metastable. There are links between the Dusseter conjecture and the Transplankian censorship. And anyway, even in the KKLT or other attempts like that, well known in string theory, there are very, very strong constraints. So the point is the following. Let's assume that the current acceleration of the universe is not due to a pure cosmological constant, which obviously lies in the swampland. But let's assume that it is caused, for example, by a quintessence model. Then the question is the following. What are the constraints on the potential of your model so that it agrees with the De Sitter uh, conjecture? Basically, this reads as a constraint that the derivative with respect to the field of the potential divided by the potential should be greater than the number of the order unity. 
Well, of the order unity is a bit vague. In some limits, this limit is known to be 0.8, but this is not a general result. And what is interesting now is to try to compare those uh, theoretical lower bounds to the experimental upper bounds. This has already been done by Starnacht, Starnacht and Waffa, and we have a, 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 an experimental upper limit of the order of 0.8. So there is already a tension between the Dusseter conjecture and the experimental upper limits. You can see them here. The um, black curve is the experimental upper limit on the equation of state parameter. It is smaller than the black curve. And you have the different curves here corresponding to different values of this lambda parameter V prime over V. And you see that basically V prime over V must be smaller than 0.6 if you want to agree with the black curve upper limit. The question now is how, um, how far can we push this reasoning and use future experiments to constrain this, uh, this uh, swampland uh, limit? Well, basically that's uh, quite uh, straightforward because in, uh, in our equation of motions, if we want to have acceleration, the only way to do that is to have a negative pressure because this is the only um, term which can be negative in this, uh, in this term. And we end up with the usual uh, classification of the quintessence uh, models. So basically we have two main classes, the freezing models where the motion of the field slowly slows down because the potential becomes flat at the redshift. And we have thawing models where the field is initially frozen due to the Hubble friction. It somehow resembles what happens in inflation. And then it starts evolving when the Hubble rate becomes small enough. So I completely skip the technicalities. We have a usual system, a very well-known system of a coupled equations. We introduce this new parameter. You are not interested in the mathematics. But to try to remain as general as possible, we have considered the three main types of models. So the so-called tracking freezing potentials that are mostly retrievable potentials where the scalar field tracks the background evolution. This means that the equation of state parameter for the field changes as the transition between the radiation dominated and the matter dominated eras. And somehow the field adapts itself automatically to the scale factor. We have scaling freezing solutions that are basically exponential potentials. And we have thawing potentials that are uh, basically harmonic potentials. Of course, I completely uh, agree uh, that there are other models. It was just impossible to check out every potential on the market. We tried to use the main classes, but this, uh, this doesn't mean to be a theorem. On the experimental um, side, we have uh, taken into account the expected uh, sensitivity of uh, Vera Rubin LSST Observatory, SKA, and Euclid. We have used the usual parametrization that David knows well. And of course, the tricky part when pushing to the future is to involve uh, the nonlinear part of the spectrum, which is uh, the, the one which is extremely important and extremely difficult to calculate because we need the general relativistic corrections for the structure formation mechanisms. We need to account for nonlinear bias. We need to account for intrinsic alignment. We need to account for the feedback of baryons and so on and so forth. And we use the Monte Carlo simulations as performed, as performed by Springer and his colleagues. So what happens? The methodology is the following. For a given potential family, we vary both the initial conditions that are by definition not known and the values of the parameters entering the model. So we scan everything. For each cosmological track, we evaluate this V prime over V function, which is the relevant one from the Swampland uh, conjecture viewpoint. And we keep the smallest value because it is of course the most uh, not, not the most, but the, the real uh, relevant one for our study. And to remain conservative, we then take only the higher of those smaller values of lambda that, are, uh, that is compatible with the required confidence level that we want to take into account. So intuitively, for each parameter choice and initial conditions, we compute W0 and WA and V prime over V and we try to understand how the observational constraints on the first can put theoretical constraints on the second. 
this is an example to fix ideas. Um, this, the different ellipses correspond to what is expected for, for example, Planck plus K1, Planck plus LSST plus Vera Rubin plus K1, Planck plus K2, and so on and so forth. And the different uh, dots here correspond to what we have for V prime over V. And what you see from this plot is that if you take, for example, Planck plus LSST plus K1, so the, the green ellipses, basically of your V prime over V cannot be greater than 0 0.25, 0 0.25. So if you do the mathematics properly, you have the following upper limits um, on a V prime over V for different confidence levels. This is for tracking freezing models. Then you can play the same game for scaling freezing models. And you have constraints that are not very dif different. And you can see them here. And play again the same game for uh, thawing models. And at the end of the day, if you gather all the models you have scanned, all the initial conditions, all the parameters, you find that uh, this generation of experiments should allow to put an upper limit on V prime over V at the level of 0.16 at one sigma and 0.20 at two sigmas. And you see that's quite nice because the um, lower bound expected is of order one. So now we are approaching nearly one order of magnitude of tension between what could be experimentally measured and the uh, naturally expected theoretical result. So I was not completely honest. In the recent version of the conjecture, we have a second criteria, criterion, sorry. Unfortunately, there is an R, so it, it means that the conjecture is not stronger, it is weaker than previously. So we have also uh, considered this second um, constraint. You can, you can have a look at the, at the paper. I won't go there into the results. And we have pushed it further by trying to understand how it could even be improved in the, um, in the, long, uh, the long run future. So this is the error on W0, this is the error on WA, and these are the constraints on the absolute value of lambda. And you see that's interesting because the behavior are not the same. For example, as a function of W0, you have a kind of continuous uh, improvement, but as a function of WA, you win a lot at the beginning and then it changes nothing. And this can be understood when really looking deeply at the cosmological dynamics. So let me come to my conclusions. Uh, is the De Sitter conjecture really able? I don't know. Uh, this is a question for string theorists, but I would bet on a yes. Because you know, the landscape of string theory does contain a, a huge amount of Minkowski solutions. The richness of the structure is nearly infinite, at least for the human uh, brain. Each geometry can support 10 to the 10 to the 5 flux vacua, and the number of compactification geometry is higher than 10 to the 1,000. But still, constructing a single metastable de Sitter solution from this huge landscape still appears as highly problematic. So it's well understood that de Sitter solutions cannot be found in regions of parametric control in string theory, and quite a lot of no-growth theorems were recently rigorously derived in some uh, sectors, of course, of the theory. So my personal guess is that this can be considered as reasonable hints that we really have a deep problem with the De Sitter solution. However, uh, of course, um, now we need numbers. So if we have an upper limit coming from experiments at the level of 0.16, it becomes interesting if the theoretical lower bound uh, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is better fixed. And we don't need another uh, a number of order one. We really need a, an accurate number. And this is, in my opinion, the main uh, challenge for the future. Thank you. OK, thank you. Ah, I think, okay, are there any questions? Any questions? Aurelian, please stop sharing screen. Yes, sure, thank you. Any questions? We have time. Is there a question from Elsa? 
Teixeira. I see hand. Okay. Maybe she was clapping. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, yes, maybe. Okay, then let us thank Professor yeah. Barrow mm -hmm. once more. And we are going to the next talk by uh, uh, Professor Ignacio Matos. Excuse me. Ignacio Matos. <laughs> Okay, let us. Uh, can you see my presentation? Yes, yes. yes we can. The Compton oh. Mass Dark Energy Model Senate. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, the, the name of my, my talk is the Compton Mass Dark Energy Model, uh, CMATE model. And it is a very simple a, a quantum mechanical explanation for the um, a, a accelerated expansion of the universe. Uh, uh, I will, uh, here's my uh, email address if you want to contact me and maybe my coordinates. Uh, in the first part, I will speak about the uh, main ideas of the CMATE model. This is a very simple uh, quantum mechanical model for the accelerated expansion of the universe. And in the second part, I will speak about the results and the um, uh, predictions of this uh, model, and you will see that they are very interesting. Well, as we know, and this is the most uh, basic and the most uh, by, uh, primitive uh, quantum mechanics, the, if we have a particle with a mass, m, then we can associate to this mass uh, a Compton wavelength. This is this uh, this particle is at the same time a wave, and uh, the mass given here is related with the Compton wavelength in this in this uh, form in this formula. Well, uh, if the particle is a massless, like the photon, then uh, the energy if we can associate to this uh, photon an energy what which is. Um, proportional to the frequency, uh, but the, now the energy comes only from the uh, momentum of the, of the particle, of the photon. But uh, we, if we use this uh, equation, this uh, Einstein equation, yes, uh, we can associate to this energy a mass, but this is not a real mass, this is a virtual mass. And with this mass, we can use again the Compton wavelength and we can associate a, a, a wavelength to this particle uh, and they are related with the frequency, they are directly related with the frequency and all of these uh, equations, all of these formulas are compat compatible and, uh, and that they, they are very known and this is the most primi primitive, primitive um, conce concepts of quantum mechanics and we know that uh, from the kindergarten. Well, uh, the idea of this paper here is to apply these formulas to the, uh, to the gravitational interaction mediator. I will call it, uh, the gravitational mediator uh, as graviton in order to be for facility. Well, the anti-graviton, uh, the um, Einstein equations predict that the graviton is a massless particle, is a, a, but the graviton has a, a, also a momentum. And with this momentum, we can associate to this graviton an energy. This energy can be associated a virtual mass. Again, this mass is not a real mass, it's a virtual mass. Well, and with this mass, we can associate to this graviton a wavelength. Uh, uh, this wavelength is related with the frequency of the graviton and so on. Well, uh, as you know, and we see this equation, lambda, uh, uh, this equation, the Compton wave equation is very known, and this is only for quantum mechanics. This equation has nothing to do with gravitation or with the Einstein equations. Therefore, we claim that this energy is an extra energy. It is not contained in the Einstein equations. This energy could be or should be uh, uh, incorporated into the Einstein equation somehow. This is an energy and everything gravitates. Therefore, this energy should gravitate as well. This is the idea, the main idea of this paper. And we, in the next slices, I, I, what I am going to do is to introduce this energy into the Einstein equations. That's all. And this is the, the main idea. Well, but there are some points that we have to take into account. The first point is that the universe is finite. And because the universe is finite, then the wavelength of the graviton should be finite. Then, but the universe is expanding. Therefore, the wavelength is growing up 
and growing up all the time. Then we have to take in the equations very, very hardly the growth of this uh, wavelength into account. And that's, I will do that in the next slices. Well, then in order, in order to introduce this quantum energy into the Einstein equations, I will proceed in the following way. Well, I will take the weak field limit, the linearized equations, the Einstein equations, and you, you see that you, uh, you know this is the uh, metric tensor can be written in the, in the uh, assume, assume as, uh, from the Mikomsky metric and some metric very small. With this very small metric, I can uh, write the uh, Rishi tensor. And if we I equal uh, the, this equal to zero means that the, you, we have a particle, a massless particle, a massless graviton, uh, or a massless uh, gravitational wave. Well, this is the same as in the in the scalar fields. This is a massless equation for the scalar field. Of course, if we want to uh, introduce the mass into the scalar field, we have to add this term. This is very well known, and this is the same in the electromagnetic field. This is the uh, the Maxwell equations for um, the Maxwell equations for vacuum. But uh, this is the photon has um, a mass equal to zero. And if we want to introduce a mass for the photon, this is the Proca equation. Then we we have to add exactly the same. Term. Well, then people proceed in the same way. This is the equation for the graviton or for the gravitational waves. And if we want to introduce a mass, then we have to add this term. Well, this is the idea of this paper. Yeah, we intro we start to with this a uh, like equation from for the graviton and, and in the next slices. Well, what we have to introduce this mass in the Einstein equations because this is the linearized equation. Well, in order to do that. The Einstein equations can be written in the Ricci form in this way. In the in vacuum, they read so. Well, in order to compare the these uh, the Einstein equations with the equation we found, we use this relationship here we found in the previous slides, and we compare that with this equation. And, and then you see the lambda should be related with the mass. Then lambda equal, uh, related to the mass in this way is just the main result of this of this paper. Well, but mass, this mass is a virtual mass, is not a real mass. Therefore, we have to introduce something that is, what is real. For example, we use again the Compton mass, uh, the, the Compton formula, but in the form of, of the mass. And then we introduce that in this equation and we recover in, and we get this equation. Well, then the, the, the main result of this paper is that lambda, that the cosmological constant is equal to two pi square over lambda square. This is the main result of this paper. And I will use this in order to see what happened if we take the lambda, the cosmological constant, equal to two pi square over lambda square. But first, I will show you what is lambda. Well, lambda, as I told you, is, uh, is the wavelength of the graviton, but the universe is expanding. Then the graviton, uh, the wavelength of the graviton is, is, is growing, uh, is increasing all the time at the speed of light. Therefore, the lambda should be related with this, uh, uh, with this uh, uh, distance, this is a unitless distance, and with, for a particle growing up at uh, the speed of light. In terms of the uh, infold um, uh, coordinates, the same, uh, the same integral looks like this one. Okay, then the C made model is only that lambda should be two pi square over lambda square, where lambda is this integral. This is all. And this is, this is the, the C made model, and this is the main result of this paper. Well, what I am going to do in the next slices is to show you what are the results, what are the, 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 um, the consequences of all of these ideas. Okay, well, th th there is. A, if we want to make a cosmology, we have to to write the a Friedman equation. But now, the rho lambda is not a, a, a dark energy. The dark energy exists yet anymore. Well, what we have is the this a consequence of the a, of the quantum a, a mechanical character of the graviton, and now lambda is this a, rh, and this rh is a, in, as in an integral. Therefore, the Friedman equation is now an integral. This equation, this uh, function here is an integral. This is an integral equation, and this is a really difficult to solve. In order to, 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 to get a differential equation, we derive, derive this equation once, 
and we obtain this new equation. They both are equivalent, but now this is an integral equation and this is a differential equation. You see here, uh, we don't have any, uh, any term with the dark energy. There exists any dark energy here. If we have curvature, we have matter, we have radiation, but not anymore. Well, and that is that, uh, what, what I claim is that this equation can explain the expansion, the accelerated expansion of the universe as we see it in, in, the, in, in the data. Well, okay, we have to take into account another thing. Look, this is the Einstein equations. If we derive it uh, covariant, uh, with, uh, uh, with a, uh, covariant derivative, uh, you know this uh, tensor is, is zero by construction. This tensor is conserved, that is zero also. This tensor is compatible with the metric, then it's, it's zero. Then we have an extra term, lambda dot, because lambda depends only on time. Then with lambda dot is in, in the uh, info coordinates, uh, is this given by this equation? We write that, which is lambda square, two pi square over lambda square, derivative is lambda cubic, and we can write that. Okay, in terms of the values of all of these constants here, uh, we can write lambda dot equal to this one. This is R, RH, we will see that in the next slides, is almost equal to three. Then it is nine. And therefore, lambda dot uh, in, in, in today is of the order of 10 to the minus 17 in megaparsecs of, uh, per year. This is really very small, really very small. Then lambda dot is almost a constant. Uh, the lambda is almost a constant. Lambda dot is almost zero. But what happened when air H is very small in the beginning of the universe? Well, then uh, what we know is that uh, uh, we must measure that in centimeters and seconds. Well, the, what we know is, for example, if the the wavelength of the graviton is lambda zero before inflation. After inflation, the air is should grow up so uh, a to the 60, for example. Then we have here a factor a, a to the minus uh, 180. This is very, very small. And again, lambda dot is again very small. Then the conclusion is that after inflation, lambda dot is really very small. And therefore, lambda is almost a constant. But it's not a constant. And this is very important that it is not a constant. Well, OK. Then we solve the uh, new Friedman equation. This equation is very, very easy to solve. You can use any numerical method, and you can solve it very, very simple. Well, and then you see we compare that here with lambda colder matter. They are really very similar. You see here for, for big red chips, this is really the same exactly the same and you see there is a difference here in the in the in, in this part and we i will show you this this uh, this uh, differences in the next slices because these differences are really very very important well um, for example if we calculate the the value of the omega lambda uh, then I, I have integrated this h yes the, i i know that and then i can integrate that numerically and what i obtain is 3. 087. If I put that in the in the equation uh, in the in the value of the lambda, lambda is equal to two pi square over lambda square, then I can recover the omega the density rate of lambda, and this is 60.69 compared with the Planck value is 68. This is very similar. Well, then therefore it is not surprising that the evolution of the density rates are exactly the same in the lambda colder matter and in the CMAID uh, model. That means that the CMAID model and the lambda colder matter are exactly the same, are exactly the same in the, uh, at the uh, cosmological level. There is no difference. Well, where is the difference? Well, the difference is in the fluctuations. You know, the Earth universe is fluctuating, dark matter and, and baryons and everything is fluctu fluctuating. And we can calculate the cosmic microwave background radiation and the mass power spectrum uh, profiles using uh, uh, numerical methods, of course. My college here perform a, a run with Monty Python, the Monty Python code using the Planck and lensing in BOA, uh, BIA, BIA, BAO uh, data together. And uh, what they found they was very, very similar to the what we found with the lambda cold matter. But there, there are two, two numbers that I have to, I want to take attention, to pay attention. The first one is this one here. 
uh, the curvature is very, very small. The universe predicted by the, with this model, predicted by the Planck 18 data is close here with a very small curvature. And uh, the other value is very interesting is the H0, the Hubble constant today. The Hubble constant today is 72. This is really, this is in agreement or this is uh, compatible with the values of the Hubble constant uh, today uh, used by, uh, by the uh, local distance ladder. Well, we perform also the Monte Python run, but now with Pantheon data, and we obtain very similar results. The H0, the, the Hubble constant is almost the same. And the, the only one, this is a little different, is the curvature. The, Mon the Pantheon data predict a open universe with a bigger, a little bigger uh, curvature. Nevertheless, if you compare all these results with the previous one, you will see that all of them are, are compatible uh, up to uh, one sigma. Then this, uh, there is no, uh, we can say there is no tension, not Hubble tension, and there is no tension between the Pantheon results or the Pantheon uh, uh, data and, and the, and the uh, uh, Planck 18 data. Here I do see the confidence level of all the values I we obtain. Uh, they are very similar as in the lambda called our matter. Therefore, this is not so interesting. Well, uh, we think that the uh, this tension, the Hubble tension, uh, can be solved here because of the following thing. Look, if we write the H zero as so, as usual here, so and put H H equal to one in the plot of the lambda CDM. A, a evolution of the a Hubble parameter and in the CMATE model evolution of the, uh, of the same parameter, you see they are different in this region where we are taking the, or when, when people is taking the uh, data for the uh, uh, local, uh, local distance ladder. Well, uh, this, is the the, the, uh, this is the region where the local distance ladder are taking data. Well, in that case, if we can now put uh, in, the, in the CMATE model, H equal to 73, and in the least LCD and lambda scholar matter model 0.65, you see though both curves are very similar, both evolution is very similar, and we we think that this is the reason why both uh, are predicting the same, but they reach at the end at different values, and uh, and this this uh, 73 is coming from the uh, uh, from the uh, uh, Planck 18 values. Well, then we can uh, now uh, plot the CMB and the M uh, mass power spectrum uh, uh, um, evolution of the uh, profiles. And you see for a flat space time, you obtain this one. But if we take into account the curvature, this is the curvature, the small curvature, what we found, you see both are exactly the same. Nevertheless, Remember, the CMATE model has no dark energy. It's, it's, it, it, this is the consequence of a very simple quantum mechanical uh, evolution of quantum mechanical character of the graviton. The, the, you, we have here non uh, dark energy. Well, and the mass power spectrum also are, is again very, very similar. So, and it, it both, uh, uh, both results are it's, it's similar. Well, the conclusions are very simple. It is possible to explain the accelerated expansion of the universe with simply quantum mechanical arguments. Out, in other words, the CMATE model, that means to put lambda equal to two pi square, lambda square, and without dark energy, we don't have dark energy here, is an excellent candidate to explain the accelerated expansion of the universe. Thank you very much. Thank you, yeah. Professor Matas, for this very interesting talk. Could you please stop sharing screen? Yes. Uh, I, I, questions? We have time for mm -hmm. questions. Uh, don't they think? Uh, still, we see your. Yes, I, I, I try. I am trying to to okay, here here. I'm sorry, I, don't, I didn't find the, the okay. Point. I don't see any questions. Yes. Okay, then in this case, let us thank Professor Matas once more. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we are going to the, the next talk by Dr. Victor da Fonseca.
please share screen, open your presentation. Hello, I'm going uh, to um, share my screen. Uh, can you see the slides? Yes, we can. Yes, a simple par parameterization for a couple back energy. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to make uh, today a presentation on the study we, we carried out with um, uh, Chuck Barrer and Nelson Munch at the uh, Institute of uh, Astrophysics here in, in Portugal. Uh, and we um, propose a simple parametrization for uh, coupled um, quintessons. Uh, as already mentioned in the uh, cosmology uh, sessions uh, this week, uh, the discovery in 98 that uh, the universe is accelerating was uh, really uh, stunning at the time. And uh, while the source of the cosmic acceleration is yet uh, to be unveiled, uh, the existence of a uh, dark energy component uh, has been uh, postulated to, uh, to explain it. And in the standard model, uh, dark energy takes the form of a uh, cosmological constant, lambda, uh, which by definition possesses a uh, constant energy density and negative pressure that fights the uh, attractive pull of, of matter. And that model is at the moment uh, compatible with all observations and it's the simplest one, at least from a uh, parametrization point of view. But one of the uh, outstanding issue is in the concordance model is the so-called um, coincidence problem. And looking at how the energy densities uh, dilute with the expansion in this plot, the fact that the cosmological constant is uh, catching up with matter at the present time necessitates initial conditions at the origin that are dramatically precise. And this issue has been paving the way uh, to study dark energy that varies in time in order to reproduce, I mean, uh, more dynamically uh, the current um, abundances. And the simplest and model independent approach uh, in this respect is uh, phenomenological. It consists in uh, parameterizing in redshift the dark energy equation of state, uh, which is the pressure over the uh, energy density that equals minus one for a cosmological constant. And the detection of a time dependence would be uh, a crucial information as it would uh, exclude uh, a cosmological constant. Ideally, uh, the best thing to do is to uh, introduce um, the freest possible parameters to avoid, uh, I mean, to limit uh, degeneracies between them. And a very simple popular parameterization is a uh, Taylor expansion at first order here in the first equation, uh, which has a uh, very limited uh, domain of uh, validity. Various improvements have been uh, introduced, like the CPL parameterization in, uh, in the second line. Our co-chair today is one of the fathers, <laughs> so to speak, and also to uh, account for the um, possibility of early dark energy, a parametrization stepwise in, in, redshift, in redshift. Uh, has been proposed, but uh, it necessitates many uh, additional uh, parameters. Instead, and uh, maybe as a novelty, with a reduced uh, number of parameters, we propose to uh, parameterize a scalar field uh, called uh, quintessence that would be responsible for dark energy, uh, both in the early and, uh, and late universe. The question is, how can we build a uh, suitable scalar field uh, parametrization? We have considered that the cosmological field is composed of uh, baryons, uh, cold dark matter, and the scalar field itself in the flat uh, friedman lemaitre uh, robertson walker background. Uh, the scalar field is supposed to be canonical, uh, homogeneous at large scale, and acting like a perfect field. And we choose to work with the number of defaults uh, as a time variable. In this slide, uh, the prime stands for the derivative with respect to the number of defaultings, and the dot, uh, the derivative with respect to, to cosmic time. And by combining the Friedman equation with the conservation of the scalar field and the conservation of matter, uh, Nunch and Litze obtained uh, a differential equation for the dark uh, energy density, uh, whose uh, general solution uh, in red is our starting point. And we have been trying to find uh, possible parametrizations that uh, enable us to solve uh, this equation analytically. And we found uh, three possibilities. We, we explored the, the, the simplest one, where five prime is a constant. We called lambda, but this time uh, lowercase lambda, not to confuse with uh, the cosmological constant. 
And the advantage of this parameterization is uh, threefold. Firstly, it's very simple, as we only add uh, one single parameter to, to extend the standard model. Uh, it allows to uh, reconstruct analytically the form of the potential uh, that you uh, read uh, here. I am sparing you uh, the exact uh, expressions of the mass scales uh, A and B, but they have exact values uh, that depend on the scalar field parameter lambda, along with uh, the other usual background parameters, H0 and, and today's dark energy density parameter. Secondly, uh, this potential being the sum of two exponential terms does alleviate uh, the severe fine tuning of the initial conditions. And we are going to see that, uh, that aspect in the next slide. And uh, last but not least, uh, despite uh, only one extra parameter, we will see that the model uh, covers a wide range of possible dark energy evolution. But first, uh, let's go back to the uh, coincidence problem. Uh, for small values of the parameter lambda, when the first exponential term, uh, the potential is, uh, is uh, steep enough, uh, the scalar field energy density, density is attracted and uh, temporarily scales with the background as the universe expands, uh, be it uh, dominated by uh, radiation and then matter. Later, uh, thanks to uh, the second shallow exponential, uh, whose slope is uh, the inverse of the first one, uh, the scalar field energy density eventually freezes, uh, resembling a cosmological constant. And by freezing, dark energy uh, overcomes matter at that time, uh, enabling the, the acceleration of the universe that we are uh, currently experiencing. And this well-known uh, attractor mechanism ensures that uh, one can start from a large uh, domain of uh, initial conditions uh, for the scalar field to reach um, unavoidably the tracking solutions and end up with uh, the correct order of magnitude during uh, matter and dark energy domination. At lower redshift, uh, and this is one of the main interests of the parameterization, one can note that uh, the additional degree of freedom, lambda, uh, governs, I mean, uh, controls a wide range of possible uh, evolutions uh, for the dark energy equation of state. And this means that uh, the model is able to uh, capture I mean, to, to catch a large variety of possible dynamics for, for dark energy. And the observational data might even uh, become uh, precise enough in the future for discriminating between uh, these uh, different uh, evolutions. As a step further, we uh, decided to, uh, to complement uh, our parameterization by assuming uh, non-minimally coupling between dark energy and, and cold dark matter, uh, the other uh, unknown component of the universe. And again, uh, for the sake of simplicity, we consider a um, conformal and constant coupling, beta, uh, that uh, parameterizes the, the interaction uh, within the dark sector between uh, dark matter and the scalar field. The stress energy tensor is jointly conserved within the dark sector, uh, preserving the, the covariance of the theory. And we uh, further assume that dark energy does not interact with baryons uh, due to uh, local uh, gravity constraints, and, um, and therefore baryons are um, conserved uh, separately. The sign of the product uh, beta times uh, phi prime, uh, that is uh, beta times lambda in our parameterization, uh, determines whether energy is being pumped from the scalar field uh, or from uh, dark matter. And we used um, the Friedman equation with, uh, with the solution we found uh, for the scalar field density, uh, to reconstruct uh, for the first time the corresponding potential with uh, similar properties as in the uh, minimally uh, coupled case. Uh, what we have done is that we have modified uh, the uh, Boltzmann code uh, class to, to accommodate that potential, as well as the uh, coupled equations uh, I displayed in, uh, in, uh, in the previous slide. And we obtain numerical results uh, plotted here that are very much in line with uh, our theoretical analysis. Uh, particularly, the, the dark energy equation of state is uh, approximately uh, given by, uh, by this uh, um, analytic expression obtained when, uh, when baryons are, are neglected uh, during matter domination. And here, uh, beta negative uh, corresponds to uh, the transfer of energy uh, from dark matter, from the dark matter component to, uh, to, to the scalar field. And the parameterization is also uh, capable of uh, reproducing the background I mean, the evolution of the, of the equation of state of the, the, the full cosmic field, uh, 
uh, dropping towards minus one uh, during the, the Scarafield uh, dominated uh, epoch. Furthermore, <coughs> in order to uh, uh, numerically predict observables that, that we use to constrain the, the parameters uh, with uh, observational data sets at the perturbative level, uh, we have again uh, modified the, the, the Boltzmann code uh, to implement uh, the coupled evolution of the uh, scalar fluctuations at linear level in the synchronous gauge. Uh, the uh, equations here are given uh, in conformal time and in Fourier, space, in Fourier space. And we modify the uh, existing uh, perturbed uh, Klein-Gordon equation, as well as the equation of motion for the dark matter density contrasts, uh, delta C, to account for the coupling by adding a source term in the right-hand side. Also, we implemented uh, from scratch uh, the evolution equation for the uh, velocity perturbations of dark matter, uh, theta c. Uh, instead of remaining constant, it evolves in time uh, with the uh, coupling force. And additionally, uh, we also modified the transformation from the, the synchronous gauge into the, the, the Kolovin gauge to maintain uh, the matter density uh, source uh, function delta m uh, gauge invariant. And finally, we similarly had to adapt the, 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 the transformation into the Newtonian gauge uh, to plot, uh, for instance, uh, the, the evolution of delta C in that gauge, uh, like, uh, like in the next slide. Uh, in parallel, uh, to provide for uh, the code uh, validation, we have uh, derived uh, the equation of motion of uh, dark matter fluctuations uh, in the Newtonian limit uh, for small scales uh, during the domination of matter uh, precisely when the coupling makes a difference in order to, uh, to compare it uh, with the numerical results obtained with uh, our modified version of class. And in the left panel, uh, we note that uh, the scalar field slows the growth of perturbations against the, the standard model by uh, decreasing the dynamical term in the equation of motion. And on the other hand, uh, the existence of the coupling brings um, competitive effects that uh, further slows the fluctuation, or uh, on the contrary, uh, accelerates them, uh, depending on whether energy is being uh, transferred from the scalar field or, or into it. And we were also able to get uh, an analytic expression of the growth rate, uh, M plus, and what you can see uh, in the right panel this time, that it matches very well uh, the numerical results in the matter era. Uh, on a small scale. And the standard growth, uh, which equals uh, one, uh, is obviously recovered for vanishing values of the, um, of the parameters. And uh, let's turn now our attention to uh, the uh, observations uh, in order to um, constrain the value of the posteriors, lambda and beta, through a uh, Bayesian inference. And given that uh, it affects uh, the growth of uh, dark matter perturbations, uh, our parametrization leaves uh, observational signatures, uh, both on the CMB and isotropies and matter power spectrum uh, that we can numerically predict and compare with uh, observations. Uh, as for the CMB and isotropies, uh, early dark energy, as well as the coupling, affect uh, the amplitude and, and position of the acoustic peaks. Uh, for instance, uh, the existence of the, the scalar field uh, decreases the, the fractional energy density of matter at the time of decoupling, and therefore the amplitude of the first peak is increased. With the coupling, the peak is further enhanced when energy is being transferred to dark matter, or lower down when the transfer happens uh, towards the, the scalar field. The coupling also alters the, the sound horizon at the coupling, inducing a global shift in the structure of the um, acoustic peaks. And we use the data from the Planck 2018 likelihood on the temperature and polarization of the CMB in the uh, MCMC analysis. As regards today's uh, linear matter power spectrum, uh, the delay or the acceleration in the growth of dark matter perturbations has got consequences too. Uh, the scalar field suppresses power on, on the smaller scales. Uh, we expect a, a smaller sigma eight than that in, in lambda CDM. But Adding the coupling, uh, the power is further suppressed, or on the contrary, enhanced, uh, depending on the direction of the, the energy transfer. Besides, we also expect modification of the uh, nonlinear uh, spectrum. Uh, for example, the delay in the growth uh, of perturbations induces a delay in the time at which a given mode enters the nonlinear region. 
And we used um, gravitational weak lensing uh, measurements, uh, cosmic shear, from the kids uh, 450 survey in the Bayesian fitting. And these are the probability contours and uh, posterior distribution we, we obtained in, in the parameter space uh, for the two specific uh, degrees of freedom uh, of the model. I focus here on, on positive lambda since there is a symmetry uh, with respect to zero uh, in the product uh, lambda times beta. On the one hand, uh, the parameter estimation done with Planck provides an upper bound uh, for the posterior lambda, uh, which is compatible with a cosmological constant. That cannot be discarded. And uh, the coupling uh, posterior, in that case, corresponds to uh, the energy injection from uh, dark energy to, to dark matter. However, on the other hand, weak lensing data brings a different constraint on, on, on the posterior lambda and do not favor vanishing value. It also slightly uh, suggests uh, the energy transfer from uh, uh, dark matter to dark energy, which is uh, the other way around uh, compared to, to Planck. Looking at the uh, posterior distributions of uh, derived uh, cosmological parameters and, and their correlation, we note that the constraints are consistent with, uh, with lambda CDL. Uh, and if we take the, the rate of clustering, uh, the parametrization seems to relax a bit the existing tensions, but obviously at the expense of two additional degrees of freedom when compared to the uh, concordance model. And we find, found that the coupling that is inferred enhances dark matter fluctuations leading to, uh, to increased value of sigma-8 uh, that are favored by, uh, by both uh, experiments. And we further undertook the, the, the same likelihood uh, analysis with uh, the standard model as a benchmark uh, to compare the, the goodness of fit of the parametrization. And in light of the reduced uh, chi-square, uh, the two models look uh, more or less equivalent, but according to the archaic information criterion, uh, since it uh, further penalizes uh, model complexity, uh, the favorite cosmology for both probes is uh, lambda CDM, and this is particularly true uh, for, for kids. Let me now uh, conclude by uh, wrapping up the, the, the results. Um, despite its simplicity, uh, the parametrization is able to cover a large span of dark energy evolution with a limited number of extra parameters while maintaining its equation of state bound at high redshift. Uh, we know that constraints on more complex uh, parametrizations are typically uh, limited by uh, the degeneracies that increase with the, the, the number of, uh, of parameters. The model preserves the fact that uh, dark matter and dark energy are comparable ratios today, while uh, it relaxes the, the initial conditions thanks to the existence of uh, tracking solutions. It is thus capable of reproducing the evolution of the background as well as the CMB anisotropies and, and the formation of uh, large uh, scale uh, structures. We therefore conclude that uh, the parametrization does help uh, constrain uh, the evolution of the equation of state and the departure from uh, lambda CDM, uh, even though uh, the approach is uh, purely phenomenological, and even though uh, the MCMC analysis still uh, reveals uh, tensions on the posteriors between uh, early and, uh, and late time uh, probes. Finally, uh, to finish, uh, we also um, carried out uh, the analysis with uh, background data, uh, but it does not provide uh, stronger constraints. And let's expect that the upcoming uh, Euclid data will, uh, will improve uh, that situation. Thank you very much for, for listening. Uh, I would be happy to, to take any questions. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you uh, for this very interesting talk. Uh, Please uh, stop sharing the screen. Okay, oh, yes, questions? Thanks. Questions? We have time for e questions. We still see you. Oh, okay. I, I don't see any <laughs> any questions. Okay, then uh, let us thank um, uh, Dr. Da Da Fonseca once more, and I mm -hmm. pass my my chairman duties to Professor Po Ilarski. Okay, thank you, Alexei. So our next speaker will be Carlos Martin, who will talk about observation constraints on nonlinear matter extensions of general relativity.
please share your screen. Okay, we see your screen. Please go ahead. Thanks very much. Uh, so, hello everyone. Uh, so my name is Carlos Martins, and here's my email if you want to contact me afterwards. Um, so yeah, I want to report on some work we've been doing in Porto, mostly with uh, uh, masters and undergraduate students. So they're currently having their exams. So so I get to uh, <laughs> come here and, and talk to you. So I, I don't need to motivate the work for this audience. We all know that the universe is accelerating and that suggests that there's new physics out there waiting to be discovered. And astrophysical facilities are trying to search for and identify and characterize it. Um, so what I want to show you is a sort of stress test of the uh, Lambda CDM model um, done in a very phenomenological way, but with, with the goal of sort of informing the possible uh, avenues of, of, uh, of new physics. Um, so, so just a word of advertisement on, on our, our team. So, so we, uh, Cosmo Espresso project, uh, we use a, a number of tools, including precision astrophysical spectroscopy, in which we are very strong, but also other theoretical and observational and computational tools uh, to try and characterize the acceleration of the universe, to try to test the universality of physical laws, and, and so on. And we also pay particular attention to future facilities who are involved in various experiments and also to, to education and outreach, which is, of course, outside the scope of this afternoon, but which I'm, I'm happy to tell you about some other time. Okay, so what do I want to do today specifically? Well, I want to summarize uh, some of our work on using uh, low redshift background data to constrain two phenomenological classes of, of models that are extensions of general relativity essentially having some nonlinear uh, matter Lagrangian. So this class is, so one of them has uh, the usual term on the right-hand side uh, of the Friedman equation, if you want to sing simply together with an additional term, which is some power of, of the energy momentum tensor. Uh, in the second class of models, uh, this extra term is some power of the trace of the energy momentum tensor. And we'll also compare them briefly uh, to a standard model just to, to guide our intuition. So as I said, uh, this is it's purely phenomenological, but it's a sort of stress test of, of the uh, of Lambda CDM. And we'll, we'll study the models under two different assumptions. So one is to assume that these are genuine alternatives to Lambda CDM in the sense that you don't have a cosmological constant in the model and therefore you want this additional mechanism, whatever the underlying physics might be, to give you the acceleration that, that we observe. Um, the other approach is to treat them as parametric extensions of lambda CDM. So in that case, you still allow a cosmological constant, but you also allow a contribution from this term. And then you just let data tell you what each of, of them can contribute, you know, how, how much the, uh, the second term, the new term can complement or, or possibly replace uh, the, the standard uh, standard term, the cosmological constant. Okay, so, so that's our, our, uh, our philosophy, so to speak. Um, so in this analysis, we'll use um, two canonical data sets. So, so the, the Pantheon supernova compilation, and also a compilation of Hubble parameter measurements, uh, which come from various sources. Some are from Crosby chronometers, some from Baryon acoustic, acoustic oscillations and so on. Um, I will not, in, in what follows, uh, talk about Hubble parameter essentially because in all our, in all our analysis, uh, the Hubble constant is always marginalized analytically, essentially using the procedure of an agnostopolis and Bazinet. Okay, so with that said, uh, let's start. Let's start with, with a sort of preliminary analysis, which is uh, to use our data sets uh, to constrain the standard CPL parameterization that our chair is very familiar with. So of course, uh, this model has been constrained many times by many people using these and other data sets. Uh, the purpose of showing it here is just as a, as a benchmark. So we want to see how constraining these data sets are for this particular model, and then use that information as a, 
as a sort of a re mental reference or a comparison point. Um, so what you find is that um, this data set constrains the matter density and, and W0 uh, fairly well, um, but it, it does not constrain WA that, that well. So what you see on the left is constraints on the omega matter W0 plane for a constant equation of states, we're assuming WA equals zero, and these are the, uh, the derived constraints at one sigma. On the right, we have the same omega matter W0 plane. Um, and you see that the constraints on omega matter and W0 don't change that much. The error bars increase a little bit, obviously, uh, but, but essentially the results are, are, are consistent. Uh, for WA, the constraint is limited by degeneracies and, and also for that same reason, it will depend a little bit on what priors you choose. Okay, so this will be our benchmark. Um, okay, so, so let's go to our first class of models, which is so-called energy momentum powered gravity. Um, so these have been proposed and studied initially by Borden Barrow and by Akar Suerol. Um, these authors mainly focused on the early universe behavior. So the, depending on parameters, uh, these models can give you bouncing universes and several other interesting things. Um, our goal is, here is to study them at low redshift. So here's what the action looks like. So we have this additional term with some arbitrary power n of, of t squared. And as I said, you still have the cosmological constant. Um, so in a sense, these models are slightly different than dynamical dark energy in the sense that you don't have a new degree of freedom with its own dynamics. You don't have a scalar field. Um, and also, you're, you're not really changing the left-hand side of the, of the Einstein equation. So they're kind of a little bit in between the, these two models, but they are, of course, purely from the world. Um, just for, for reference, um, the homogeneous and isotropic case, here's what the uh, Friedman, Richard, Uri, and continuity equations look like. Only two of them are independent, as usual. Um, it, it should be clear that if I take the limit n going to zero, I recover lambda CDM. Uh, in addition to n equals zero, the case that n equals one half and n equals one can also be studied analytically. Uh, but in general, you, you can study the model numerically. Um, and it will be convenient to parameterize the contribution of, of the new term, so the nonlinear contribution by a dimensionless quantity uh, that I call uh, Q, uh, which is defined like this. So N is this, um, this coupling, but uh, it will have some dimensions. To make it dimensionless, you have to multiply it by a, a suitable power of the critical density. Um, so here's constraints for two cases where n is fixed. So case n equals one. Uh, so, so that will, will have some, some problems at high redshift, but you can nevertheless constrain it at low redshift. So you see n equals one on the left, n equals one half on the right, and, and you have so what I call q1 and q1 half, which are the values of this parameter in each case. Um, so on the left part of each pair of panels, you see the constraints from this data alone. Uh, the second plot in the pair is the constraint that you get if in addition to this data you use uh, a Planck prior on the matter density. Obviously, the constraints become a lot tighter. And what is represented both here and, and in the slides that follow is always the one, two, and three sigma contours uh, in this plane. And the color map represents the reduced chi-squared at, at each point in the parameter space. And, and the uh, color map is always between zero and, and three. Okay, so what happens if I let n, so this power, be a free parameter? I just include it in the analysis, so I, I sort of scan all possible powers uh, of, of, the, um, of the term. Um, so there will be significant degeneracies, but the result, nevertheless, is that if you don't have a cosmological constant, so if you switch the usual lambda to zero, then you basically are constrained to get n equals zero. So whatever replaces lambda must be very similar to lambda. You can to think of it like that. So here, here's the, so on, on the top left, you have the case uh, where omega lambda is zero, and I, I, I impose that I have ordinary matter. So the equation of state of matter or, or this fluid is w equals zero. There's a big degeneracy, but, uh, uh, so, so you get a slightly larger value of omega matter than the usual case, but not by much. And, and, and it is basically consistently zero. 
Um, if you do have a, an omega lambda, uh, then there's a big degeneracy and, and you don't constrain N that well, but you're still, you, you constrain omega matter more or less to be the usual value. Uh, on the other hand, if you don't have a cosmological constant, if you set omega lambda to zero, but allow a barotropic equation of state that need not be matter, um, then you get a bit more freedom, but, but not by, by, by a lot. So N is still constrained be very close to zero. These are one sigma constraints. Uh, and we have a slightly negative equation of state, but again, not by much. Okay, so that's our first class. So the second one uh, is actually a particular case of, of a FRT models. If you take the case where this function is R plus some function of T, uh, then you get a class of models which is phenomenologically analogous to the previous one. But now you have t replacing t squared. And your action would now look like this with, with some power n. And qualitatively speaking, you, you might think that there's a there's a, a mapping between the two classes of models where you just uh, relate the two powers by a factor of two. But actually, things are a little bit more complicated than that. So this is true qualitatively, but not quantitatively. Again, in this case, there are several interesting cases with specific values of n, some of which are known in the literature, but others not so much. Um, in this case, typically we have one more free parameter than in the uh, energy momentum powered case, uh, even if you assume flat models. So there's a wider parameter space, but, but, that, but again, you can study the, the case with, with a generic value of n. So actually, when I submitted the abstract, I was hoping to have these results completely finished by, by the talk. Uh, this is unfortunately not the case. We're still running uh, a few cases. Uh, we should have the results out very soon. So in, in, the, in the remaining minutes, I'll just show you uh, one example of, of so the analysis for the case n equals one half. So there's been some papers in the literature recently, not, not, all, not all of them agreeing with each other. Uh, so we decided to, to look at this one to begin with. And, and just as, a, as an additional comment to what I said earlier, so the case n equals one half here is sort of similar to the case n equals one quarter in the energy momentum powered case, uh, in the sense that the Friedman equations will be the same in, in, the two, in the two classes of models, but the continuity equations will not be the same. So, so this is why I said earlier that things are related, but they're not exactly identical models. Okay, so, so what happens in the n equals one half case? Um, essentially, the message is if you set lambda to zero, then the model is ruled out, uh, essentially because the best you can do is to get a reduced chi-square of 1.8. Um, so, so the more general case, which is this plot and, and this line, uh, where you allow a, a constant equation of state that may not be zero, you get an omega matter that is not too different from the standard one or the one you get from CPL but you get a much, much, much worse reduced chi squared. So, so clearly you need a cosmological constant in, in this case. Um, if you have a cosmological constant and allow this additional term, then zeta is the analogous parameter to the previous one that tells you, so it's a dimensional parameter that tells you how much of, of the additional term uh, data allows. Um, again, so, so you, you have a sort of one sigma preference for a non-zero value, uh, but at two sigma, you, you, you are consistent with this value being zero. Okay, so, so let me finish. Um, so the result of, the, of this stress test, which, which as I said, uh, we're still finishing up, seems to be that lambda CDM paradigm is robust. So, so even if you interpret it as a, uh, an approximation to some more fundamental model that we don't yet know, at the purely phenomenological level, it, it seems to be a, a good approximation. Um, so if there is no true lambda, the alternative mechanism, if it's a mechanism of the type we studied, must be very similar to a cosmological constant. So you don't get that, that much freedom. Um, if you treat these models as parametric extensions and you allow this term to contribute in addition to a cosmological constant, um, then low redshift data allows contributions maybe at the, uh, 
at the 10% level. Um, and, and I should emphasize low redshift data because the only data we use so far is low redshift background cosmology data. Of course, if you include higher redshift data, and of course the CMB is the prime example of that, uh, th th then you get tighter constraints. Um, yeah, and, and that, that's basically uh, what, what I wanted to say. So we're, we're finishing up this, this work and we, uh, we hope to, to, have it, to have it out in the, in the not too distant future. So thank you and, and I'm happy to answer any questions or clarify something that wasn't clear. Okay, thank you very much, Carlos, for this interesting talk. Any question? Okay, if not, then thank you again for your talk. Thank you. And please unshare your screen. Okay, thank you. And so our next speaker will be Denitsa Staikova, who will talk about testing late-time cosmic acceleration with uncorrelated baryon acoustic oscillations data set. Hello to everyone. Uh, hello. Uh, okay. Are you hearing me? Yeah, okay, right now. Um, yes, I'm going to share the whole screen. Okay, now you should oh, be able to... Yeah, yeah, it's okay. Yeah, okay, fine. Well, um, thanks and uh, hi to everyone. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to present our work, which we did with uh, David Benisti on uh, baryonic uh, acoustic oscillations. So I will start uh, with a little introduction. Uh, I will refer you to the talk, uh, the plenary talks uh, from yesterday, which uh, discussed uh, the topic uh, about uh, the BAO in um, great detail. Uh, so for anyone interested. Uh, so what are the BAO? The BAO are uh, uh, waves in the uh, baryonic matter of the post-inflationary universe, which are born from the over densities, uh, which come with the fluctuations in matter uh, from inflation. Uh, due to these over densities, uh, one observes uh, acoustic waves, which mean pressure waves, which expanded uh, with uh, the universe uh, until the universe expanded enough so that uh, it becomes cool enough to uh, so that the photons can decouple. And so the pressure will disappear and the wave will freeze. Uh, the waves uh, freeze on the sun horizon, so this is the distance uh, which they were able to travel uh, in this time. And what is important about uh, them is that uh, this sun horizon uh, is defined by a rather simple physics, so we can uh, calculate it, uh, which enables us to measure distances in uh, uh, cosmology, because it is a standard ruler. Uh, the BAO are observed in a uh, large scale structures. So uh, any uh, experiment which is uh, tracing the distribution of uh, large scale structures will be able to observe them. And they can be seen as a bump in the uh, two point correlation function, meaning a small over density uh, at the distance of uh, the sun horizon or as uh, acoustic peaks in the power spectrum, which uh, you can see here. Uh, so, this is uh, the introduction which I'm uh, giving with you, uh, which I think will be sufficient for our purposes. So now, what are we doing? Well, uh, as I said, uh, I hope you can see my uh, pointer, hopefully. So as I said, uh, we know this uh, distance here. We measure this uh, angle um, to certain astronomical object. And this means that we can uh, calculate the distance uh, it. Why uh, using this very simple relation? Uh, where what is important uh, to take away is that the sun horizon is something uh, which is defined in a very simple way. Uh, so basically, uh, it depends only on the baryonic uh, uh, density and the radiative density. So these are uh, the only things uh, which we need to know in order to calculate it. Uh, so we know this uh, quantity uh, rather well. Now, the why is this important? Uh, distances in cosmology are important because they depend depend uh, very much on the model uh, which we are considering uh, using this uh, for uh, formula, uh, where this formula is of course uh, uh, 
uh, used in case of one CDM if uh, it wasn't uh, the one CDM model. Here we would have only the energy density if it's uh, some kind of, kind of uh, modified gravity. But in our case, we're using uh, one CDM. So we see that uh, the co-moving angular distance, uh, dm, depends uh, on uh, S of k, uh, which uh, introduces the spatial curvature using uh, this formula here. And it also depends on the equation of state of the universe, uh, which is given here. So using the Friedman equation in uh, one CDM, we have a connection between the evolution of the scale factor and the equation of sta state E of Z. So this equation of state in uh, the one CDM model, as uh, we know very well, uh, basically depends on the different uh, contributions to the matter energy of the universe, which uh, contribute as different uh, powers of the redshift. So this is uh, uh, more or less uh, most of the formulas which we will, we will be using in our work. So what is the idea? The idea is uh, that we have some observations and we want to infer the cosmological parameters from them, which correspond to these observations, meaning that we want to uh, evaluate the energy densities. Now, about the data set, well, uh, as I said, the BAO are calculating from large-scale structures, uh, structures. So we have uh, gathered a lot of uh, data points uh, from uh, measurements from all the way back to 2008. Uh, that these are a lot of points, obviously. Uh, so uh, we complement this uh, data set with uh, the cosmic chronometers, uh, which can independently measure the Hubble parameter. Also, we add to this uh, the standard candles, uh, which in our case are the supernovae type 1a, the quasars, and the gamma ray bursts. So as a whole, we have about uh, 273 points, I think, uh, in our uh, work. And uh, so now the question is, uh, what to do with these points? Uh, first, uh, what are we using? We're using a polycord, which is a nested uh, uh, Monte Carlo Markov chain sampler. And we have uh, five parameters, which are uh, uh, the two energy densities, omega matter and omega lambda. We have uh, the H0, which is the Hubble constant today. We have the sound horizon, and we have the ratio between the sound horizon and the fiducial sound horizon, which has been used to produce the measurements which we are using in our data set. So now uh, it is important to mention that uh, in our work, uh, the sound horizon and the, uh, this ratio are independent parameters. So we are not taking them uh, from other people's work. So we're just using them as parameters and we're uh, calculating them from our uh, data. Uh, so uh, this is uh, important to keep in mind. Now about the priors. Uh, the priors which uh, we're using are uh, written here. As you can see, we have uh, flat priors uh, with uh, uniform priors, uh, which are rather uh, wide. For example, for H0, we have all the way from 50 to 100. Uh, also, for the extended models, we have uh, the following omega k and uh, w. Again, they are I think rather large, so that we're not forcing any uh, model on our data, which we expect. And also we complement this with uh, the measurement by RIS, which is a local uh, measurement, as we know. So this is the value of um, H0, which uh, we're using as a prior, a Gaussian prior, uh, which we uh, use on our data. So now what we're doing? Well, if we had uncorrelated data, we would be using this uh, chi-square function to uh, calculate our parameters. However, the problem with the BAO data set is that it's not very uncorrelated, especially in our case where uh, we're getting uh, the data from different surveys. So they may have uh, some correlation between them, but uh, they are either non not known or not known for uh, the whole data set. So it's hard to write one uh, full covariance matrix and use it. So uh, instead we use uh, something else. So the covariance matrix for uncorrelated data should use uh, should be a diagonal matrix uh, from with this form. However, since we expect that uh, there are some uh, correlations between the data, we will add uh, some mock covariance to our data. This procedure has been developed in this article here. Uh, so we're following basically this article uh, for this part of the work. Uh, so what we do is that uh, instead of using embodied simulation to calculate the correlation which we expect for our data, instead we select randomly uh, some 
terms from our uh, covariance matrix, and we add uh, by hand some uh, correlations uh, with this uh, amplitude. So here, this is the error of our measurements. So basically, we're adding uh, some non-diagonal term, terms to our matrix. We're using this chi-square function, which corresponds to correlated data. And from it, we use polycord to obtain the following uh, data, uh, the following values of the parameters for the different uh, number of correlations. So we have uh, zero correlations. We have uh, uh, three uh, points, um, three correlated correlated terms and six correlated terms. So basically we have from zero to 30% of correlations of our data. And what we see is that the correlations doesn't change the final result uh, by more than 10%. You can uh, see it by yourself in this table. This is for BO and the BO plus uh, there is prior. And uh, we see that uh, the dif differences are rather small. So from this, uh, we decide that these are uncorrelated points and uh, we can use them without uh, writing the full covariance uh, matrix, uh, which uh, in our case uh, can be considered unknown. But even if there are small correlations, they will have very little effect on the presented results. So this, is, this was the first part of our work. Now, what we got uh, from our uh, inference of the parameters. First, uh, for the one the CDM model, uh, here, uh, until the end of the presentation, we are considering four combinations of uh, data set plus uh, priors. So first, uh, we have the BO points alone. We have the BO points plus the RIS prior. We have the uh, cosmic chronometers plus the standard candles plus the BO points uh, together. And we have the same uh, number of points, which we call the full data set uh, with the RIS prior. So the risk prior is a very tight prior. So it is supposed to change the result uh, significantly. So we have to keep this in mind. Uh, while well, all the other priors are uniform and they are rather large. So not uh, unexpectedly for the alone points, we see that they cannot uh, constrain a lot the Hubble uh, constant or the omega uh, matter, which is um, on this axis. Uh, this was expected. With this prior, we can see that uh, there is a significant uh, constraint on the contour. However, it is still, uh, uh, it cannot give us uh, some uh, very uh, interesting new information. What we see is that, uh, as expected, when we introduce this uh, uh, additional prior, the Hubble constant becomes uh, rather, uh, rather large. While if we use the full data set, uh, with the cosmic chronometers and the standard candles, we see that uh, the risk prior is uh, no longer affecting, uh, giving us uh, such significant effect. And we see that the Hubble constant becomes uh, rather small. Uh, even with the risk prior, uh, you can see here the difference between the uniform prior and the risk prior. So it is not uh, that much. Uh, but of course, uh, the difference exists. Also, we see that the omega matter contour is also uh, much smaller. So basically, just uh, as expected, uh, the introduction of uh, the full data set uh, rather constrains the model and gives us uh, more interesting numbers to work with. Now, the second, on the second plot, you can see the sun horizon versus the uh, Hubble constant. Now, this, is, uh, this was the first uh, uh, kind of interesting part. Uh, of our results. And it is, uh, um, I mean, chronologically, it was uh, the first one. Uh, and it is that uh, having a very small uh, tight prior on the sun horizon basically limits the Hubble constant significantly, meaning that if we get uh, a prior, which is in this part of the plot, we will get a rather large uh, Hubble constant. And vice versa, if we get uh, sun horizon uh, on this part of the uh, plot, meaning higher uh, sun horizon, we will see a Hubble constant, which is uh, rather small. So uh, this, is, this means that it's important to keep the sun horizon prior large so that uh, we don't introduce artific artificially some limitations on the Hubble constant. So you can see this uh, here that uh, uh, also, what you can see here is, uh, and I'm going to discuss in the next slide uh, additionally, is uh, the degeneracy between the sun horizon, the Hubble constant, and also omega matter, as um, I will mention later. So basically, they are lying on this uh, line. And uh, 
as expectedly somewhat. Uh, you can uh, see that uh, depending on the data set which we are, we are using, we will get a different value for the sound horizon, which of course is interesting considering that uh, we uh, think that we know how to calculate the sound horizon rather well. And uh, basically this has been uh, mirrored uh, in other people's results. So the results from the local measurements for sound horizon are um, are rather small, while the Planck results for sound horizon are a little bit big. Uh, so this uh, also coincides with our uh, results. Uh, now, so uh, this uh, plot, we have already seen it uh, in a number of presentations on this conference. So this uh, paper is uh, rather important and it discusses the degeneracy between the sound horizon, the omega matter density and the Hubble constant. So here we have the uh, Hubble constant and the sound horizon. Uh, the omega matter dependence is uh, color coded, but we won't be discussing this here. So this uh, with orange is the shoes measurement, with green is the BO measurement plus the supernovae, and uh, with the contours are the Planck measurements. So how our results fit in this plot? Well, our results are on the plot on the right. Uh, where we have only the sound horizon versus the Hubble constant. And here with the same colors, uh, I have given with these arrows uh, when these points uh, fall on this uh, plot here. So basically just um, we uh, fit very well in this plot because uh, you can see that the BO points plus the risk uh, prior uh, fall in this uh, intersection between BO and local measurements. Uh, which is expected since there is prior is basically a local measurement. Uh, then we have uh, uh, the combination between uh, the full data set and there is prior uh, comes a little bit lower, uh, much closer to the purely BAO point uh, measurements. And then when we have just the full data set with, uh, without uh, the risk prior, but with a uh, uniform prior, we see that we are much, much closer to the Planck measurements. So Again, our result, just as many other results, uh, contributes to the, our understanding that um, the H0 tension is not merely an H0 tension, but this, it is a tension in the RD H0 uh, plane. So basically, we have to account for both the sun horizon and also uh, for omega matter when we're discussing the tension because uh, they equally contribute uh, to this tension. Uh, however, um, we are happy that our results fit very nicely in this plot. Um, so this is our first part, uh, the first part of, of our work. And now about the extensions. Well, we have extended with two models. Uh, first, we have included uh, spatial curvature in our model, and you can see the results here. So as somewhat uh, expectedly already, the BAO points alone are not able to constrain too much um, the spatial curvature. However, what we see is that um, they, with or without the risk prior, uh, kind of prefer a negative uh, uh, special curvature de density. So here, however, uh, when we have uh, only the BO points, we see that uh, zero is still part of the contour, so it's not excluded. However, when we add the full data set uh, with uh, all the points, we see the contours are significantly uh, constrained and uh, for our uh, somewhat uh, surprise, we saw that uh, they exclude uh, zero from uh, their contours. Uh, so we have definitely a negative uh, spatial cur uh, curvature density, which means uh, that our universe is closed. We have k equals uh, to one. Uh, so we have definitely a negative uh, density. Uh, so this is the first result. And then the second result, uh, which is uh, when we includes uh, WCDM, meaning we no longer have a cosmological constant, but we have some kind of dependence on the redshift. We see that um, our um, result, uh, the, the BO alone, uh, kind of prefers uh, uh, smaller than minus one uh, W, while uh, if we include uh, the whole data set, we see that we have, uh, uh, we still include one CDM, which is, um, 
uh, W equals minus one, but it have some preference for a bit larger than minus one uh, W. So these are the results from the uh, extensions. Now I have plotted here, uh, taking the measurements from this uh, work by Di Valentino, and I have added our uh, results for the special curvature. And we can see that our results um, more or less contribute to a number of uh, measurements which uh, give a negative uh, spatial curvature, curvature energy density. So uh, it is kind of uh, uh, mounting evidence that maybe there is something interesting here. And uh, as you can see, the error with the full data set is uh, rather small. And uh, the conclusions I'm uh, finishing, uh, we have seen that uh, the BEO combined with other cosmological uh, probes can be used to constrain uh, the cosmological parameters. Uh, we have seen that the one CDM remains the best fit model. We have seen it uh, with the uh, Kaike uh, information criteria. Uh, we have seen that uh, there is uh, a small, uh, very low statistical support uh, for a closed universe. And there is some more significant support for WCDM universe with um, a larger than minus one W parameter, which can be used to co <clears throat> also to constrain some uh, modified gravity theories. And uh, finally, on the tension, we can see that the BO data alone cannot alleviate the H0 tension. However, combined with some <clears throat> with additional cosmological props, uh, like the standard candles and the cosmic chronometers, we see that uh, it gives uh, a result which is in the middle between the CMB measurement and the local uh, measurement. However, it still cannot, uh, we cannot say that it can alleviate it entirely. Uh, so it cannot fix the tension. However, the results are interesting. And also what we saw also very strong dependence on the final value of phase zero on the choice of the sun horizon. So this is something to keep in mind when working with uh, the observations because in uh, many of the earlier works, uh, the sun horizon is included in the measurement. So it makes a little bit more sense to exclude it and to have it as an independent parameter so that uh, we can uh, also obtain some interesting information about the very early universe. So the work was published in astronomy and astrophysics. And uh, basically that is it. Thank you for your attention. And um, I, if there are any question, questions, I'll be glad to answer. Uh, also uh, here are the, I have included as an additional slides, the numbers which we get and the data set. So they will be on the website if anybody is interested or uh, also in our article if anybody wants to uh, give a look. Okay. So, okay. so thank you very much for your, for this interesting talk. Thank you. Okay. Unfortunately, we have no time for questions. So we will... I'm sorry. <laughs> but we, people can ask questions by with a chat, of course, right? So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, but maybe I should say that uh, the messages in chat I, uh, are not seen when you're in full screen. So that, so I'm sorry, I uh, I took too much. Yeah. No, no, it's okay. <laughs> okay. okay. Thank you again for this interesting talk. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, it's just that we have a tight time schedule. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. So our next speaker will be. Uh, Andrew McLaughlin. Uh, Denitza, please unshare your screen. Mm, I think I stopped sharing it. Okay, so McLaughlin, Andrew, please go ahead, share your screen. Can you see it? No, oh yes, yes we can. Okay, so the title will be Gravitational Interaction in the Chimney Lattice Universe. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, I will be presenting my team's research on the effects of gravitational interaction in the chimney in the lattice universe. Um, questions we should... Um, ask first, what is the shape of space? Is the universe infinite or is there a limit to the 
size of the universe. The shape of space could be positively curved, negatively curved, or have zero curvature. Since general relativity does not favor any particular topology, theoretically speaking, space could be simply connected in agreement with concordance cosmology, or space could be multiply connected. With a multiply connected universe, then it may have a finite volume, even for a flat or negatively curvature. Also in a multiple connected universe, a photon is able to travel multiple times across the volume of space, which generates multiple images of the emitting source as a signature. Spaces with turtle may be presented as a common example of multiple connected spaces from one to three dimensions such as three torus, chimney, and slab. There are many studies on the potential indications of the shape of space, with the majority of research is focused on the relations to the cosmic microwave data. CMB anomalies and large angular scale observation, like the suppression of the quadruple pole moment and the quadruple pole and octopole alignment are imprints of spatial topology. The current data available has yet to determine the finites of its volume if the universe covers a much wider region than the observable universe. A small volume points at the possibilities of finding observable indications of its topological features. Possible topological imprints and CMB observation place constraints on the radius of the largest sphere inscribed in the topological domain from Planck 2013 data for the three possible topologies. The constraints placed for the flat universe with equal sided chimney topology, the radius of the largest sphere that may be inscribed is greater, greater than 71% of the recombination surface. The parameter X subscript rec specifies the distance from the recombination surface and is the same order with the particle horizon. The X subscript rec being 14 gigaparsecs. Gravitational potential created by fluctuations in matter density is defined by the scalar perturbations of the metric coefficient. Matter is pressureless and can be considered in the form of discrete point-like gravitating bodies of masses to represent galaxies. Therefore, the co-moving mass density is listed below. I think I'm on the wrong slide. Oh, sorry. Um, sorry about that. Um, characteristics of the universe manifested in the shape of gravitational potential and forces. The inhogeneous universe gravitational field is sourced by fluctuations in the matter density. By employing the perpetuated Einstein's equations from the very beginning, one automatically includes essential relativistic effects of the formulation and for the gravitational potential and obtains a Hamloitz type equation. As we show in our present work for chimney topology, it is now possible to obtain the exact solutions of this equation. Herein, we derive the distinct expressions for the gravitational potential and forces and alternative methods and point out the particular solutions appearing in the form of some dual potential. Gravitational potential created by fluctuations in matter density is defined by scalar perturbations of metric coefficients. Matter is pressureless and can be considered in the form of discrete point-like gravitating bodies of masses to represent galaxies. Chimney topology, which admits a single infinite axis subject to the preferred description of the quadruple and octopole alignment and commonly named the axis of easel, acknowledges either flat or negative curvature. With gravitational potential defined by scalar perturbations, the metric coefficients and that of the framework of general relativity, it satisfies the linearized Einstein's equation. Ignoring peculiar velocities in the case of conventional lambda CMD cosmological model, the equations are listed. Working with the shift of potential makes it possible to employ the superposition principle in the solving the Hemlitz equation. 
the zero subscript of the phi indications that peculiar velocities have been disregarded, and the overhead indicates that gravitational potential is shifted. The screen in length is represented by lambda. Once a solution for a single particle located at the center of a Cerigitin coordinates is found, we can write the solution for a full system made up of randomly distributed particles. For chimney topology, Tori 1 has a period of L1 along the x-axis and Tori 2 has a period of L2 along the y-axis. Therefore, each gravitation source has its images at points shifted from the original location by multiples of Tori period L1 and L2 along their corresponding axis. For a principal particle with a mass place at the center of a Cartesian coordinates for the chimney topology, the delta functions of X and Y are presented. Within these formulas are the infinitely many periodic images. The screen in length, which is represented by lambda, serves as a crucial parameter as it specifies the distance from its source or images at the gravitational potential, which undergoes exponential cutoff. Peculiar velocities may be effectively scored by employing the effective screen in length. Today's screen in length is approximately 2.6 gigaparsecs. The first alternative solution that we found follows from the Fourier expansion of delta functions into series using periodically in two toroidal dimensions, which is represented with the subscript cos. The observational data show that this perimeter should be less than one in today's universe. The second alternative formula is the summation of the solutions of the Helmholtz expression for a source mass and its infinitely many images, which are in the form of the equal potentials, which is represented by the subscript EXP. There is also a third way to express gravitational potential for a chimney topology, which is a equal type interaction subject to periodic boundary conditions can be formulated via Ewald sums, so the expression for the potential consists of two rapidly convergent series. For any desired precision, one must determine the minimum number of terms needed to calculate the potential numerically. The criterion used to specify this number n is the ratio listed and should be less than one tenth of a percent. The formula requiring the fewest number of terms to define gravitational potential up to one tenth percent accuracy is our preferable solution. For each of the potential, the number n can be different. So we detonate these as n exp, n cos, and n mix. The formula requiring the smallest number of terms to define phi up to the adopted accuracy is clearly the best alternative numerically computation purpose. Since our formulas contain double series and values of n correspond to the combined numbers of sets K1 and K2, which the required precision is achieved. The charts in the, are the values of the gravitational potential and corresponding N values for EXP, cos, and mix of terms in the series at selected points for the effective screen of length of 0 0.01 and 0 0.1, which is listed respectively. The quantities N cos and N mix indicate the number of terms in the formulas respectively that one needs to keep in order to obtain the same values of the potential at the selected points with the same precision. Due to N exp having the least number of terms, the gravitational potential with the exp is the preferable solution being easier to calculate computationally than the gravitational potential with the mixed script. Shown is the graphs of the rescale gravitational potential for the effective screening length of 0 0.01 and 0 0.1. We look at gravitational forces along the X and Z axis. We omit the Y axis due to the symmetry of the model. The X and Y projections are similar. To calculate the gravitational forces, we use the same selected points as we've used for the potentials. 
The accuracy of the gravitational force are like that of the gravitational potential. The least number of terms required to achieve the precision of less than one tenth of percent is our preferable solution. We've derived three alternative formulas for the X and Z components of the rescaled forces using the same scripts as we used for the potential to differ between each alternative solution. The first alternative solutions for the X and Z components are listed. And the charts provided show the values of the Z component of the rescaled gravitational forces and corresponding numbers for three alternative formulas for the effective screen lengths of 0 0.01 and 0.1. And the charts provided show the values of the X component of the rescaled gravitational forces with the three alternative formulas. As was the case for gravitational potentials, show the formulas phi EXP and phi mix, which are related to Yukawa and Yukawa Ewa potentials, are the preferable for the physically re relevant case of the effective screening length less than one. Our calculations were performed in Mathematica for all tables and graphs provided. Provided the graphs for the rescaled X component for the gravitational forces of effective screening length of 0 0.01 for the Z equals zero and Y equals zero. Here is the graph for the rescaled X component of the gravitational force for the effective screening length of 0 0.1 for the section Z equals to Y zero and y equals zero. The rescaled z component of the gravitational forces effective screen of length of 0 0.01 and 0 0.1 are shown. We have examined how chimney topology of the universe affects the form of gravitational potential and consequently gravitational force as well. With this connection, we have proposed three alternative forms of solution. One is based on the Fourier series expansion of delta functions using periodicity along the toroidal dimensions. The second formula follows the direct summation of the Helmholtz equation, each in the form of the Yukawa potential for a source particle and its all its periodic images. And the third formula is formulated via Ewald sums for Yukawa potential. For all three alternative forms, the screen and length serves as a crucial parameter as it specifies the distance at which gravitational potential undergoes the exponential cutoff. The main goal of our research was to reveal which of the alternative formulas would serve better as a tool to be employed in numerical calculations. For both gravitational potential and forces, the formulas that involve direct summation of Yukawa potential present the best case for effective screening length being less than one. Obtaining the desired accuracy achieved by keeping the fewest number in terms of the series as possible is key. Thank you everyone for your attention. Okay, Andrew, thank you very much for this interesting talk. Thank you for having me. Okay, are there any questions? Maybe I have one. All right. So, um, I guess when you when you consider Yukawa potentials, you can tune the screening length. Mm -hmm. And then could you really see, at what point could you see a difference between adding this Yukawa and, and not having them in a really, for realistic potentials, of course. Could well, you, our, I was gonna say all of our calculations were done on Mathematica. So we based all of our things off of how many terms it required to do the calculations. And then with that, um, one of them was a lot quicker to calculate computationally over the our third formula that we found. 
like the first one took probably about a minute to calculate computationally using Mathematica, while the third one took probably about 10 to 15 minutes. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Okay, if there are no other questions, let's thank um, our speaker again. Okay, thank you very much. And our next speaker will be Biagio De Simone. Yes. We talk on the Hubble constant tension in the supernova quantum sample. Please uh, go ahead, Biagio. Yes. Please let me know if the screen is visible. Not yet. Okay, you, you can share your screen. Yeah, of course. Okay, we see your screen. Okay. Can you see the presentation? Uh, yes, but there okay. is a weird, uh, there is a weird black rectangle there. Yeah, just a second, uh, excuse me. Which I guess is not part it's, of the talk. It is a light glitching. I will share directly the presentation and not the, not the screen. Just a moment, please. Okay. Let me know now. Uh, not yet. We don't see your. You share your screen, but the screen is black. Yeah, and I think it will be. Okay. Let me know if it is possible now to. Okay, just a moment, please. Yes. If, if the black rectangle is only on the first slide, it's not a problem. About now? Uh, we don't see anything. Mm. It's black, full black. Just a second. Yes, yes, please go ahead. Yeah, I think this will be better. Okay, so you can see the, the presentation, but not in full screen with the panel of a PowerPoint, right? Exactly. It's not yeah. full screen, but we can see the presentation. Okay, so uh, I'm sorry for the technical inconvenience. I will be starting soon. So um, thank you, first of all, for the chance of taking part in this important meeting and talk. My name is Biagio De Simone, and today I will be talking about the Hubble constant tension in the Supernovae 1A Pantheon sample. Okay, first of all, I want to mention that... Uh, this sorry, was... sorry, sorry. Ah, okay. First of all, I want to mention that uh, this work is part of a published paper, Maria Giona Dainotti et al. 2021. Here you can see also all the contributions, uh, all the authors of this paper. So I, uh, I took part in this paper as a second author. And here you can see also the institutions of reference. This was like an international uh, collaboration. Okay, so I will introduce briefly the problem of the Hubble constant tension. The Hubble yeah. constant tension is defined as the ratio between the, the prime derivative of the scale factor R computed at time, at time t0 over the scale factor computed at the same time t0, we mean with the t0, the, the present time. Uh, now, what, what, what is the main problem concerning the Hubble constant? Uh, from the models, from uh, the main models, like the lambda CDM, the most accepted ones, we know that this constant should be indeed a constant, but experimentally, we see a huge discrepancy between the values of the local measurement of uh, H0 of the Hubble constant uh, com compared with the values of the Planck measurements. And this uh, discrepancy goes from four to six sigma. And this huge discrepancy is still object of debate. In our work, we made use of two main cosmological models. So the Lambda CDM model and the WCDM model using the CPL Chevalier Polarsky Linder parameterization. The Lambda CDM model, despite being, as I said, the most ac accepted scenario for describing the structure of the universe, suffers from open problems such as the Hubble constant tensions. Um, many alternatives have been proposed, and in this work, we will uh, inspect this particular tension, H0 tension, in the Pantheon sample, also using the W0WA parameterization as it is written here. 
One advantage of this parametrization is that it avoids the divergences in the integral of the distance luminosity, since the form is parametrized in this way with the redshift. In order to test our cosmological model, it is necessary to compute the distance moduli, which is expressed as mu theoretical. It is given by this expression, and the delta L is a function of the redshift and the cosmological parameters. Now, the quantity DL that is written in the, in the formula, it is called the luminosity distance. At its form depends strongly on the cosmology that we're using. So, for example, in the lambda CDM model, we have this, uh, um, this uh, simple form where we neglect the contribution of a curvature since we are considering a flat lambda CDM model and the radiative contributes since they are um, smaller compared to the other ones, as we saw in the pie chart in the, in the slide before. In the W0, WAC, the pattern parametrization, the form is this one. Uh, for our analysis, we use the supernovae type 1A. Supernovae type 1A are a particular class of supernovae with absence of hydrogen lines. Well, what is the physics behind the supernovae type 1A? When you have a binary system of stars where we have a white dwarf and a red giant, for example, the most common and accepted scenario for describing this phenomena, it may happen that the expansion of the red giant uh, lets the materials surpass the Roche lobes of the system, and then the materials fall onto the white dwarf, accreting its mass. Once the mass surpasses the Chandrasekhar limit, then the combustion of um, carbon and oxygen into the white dwarf is ignited. But since the whole white dwarf is composed by these elements, it means that the white dwarf is really bursted, uh, ripped apart in a bright explosion. And due to the precise threshold that we have for the Chandrasekhar limit, we have that the peak magnitude of the supernova is around the same value, it is nearly fixed. So we have that uh, those can be considered as excellent standard candles. The observer distance moduli of supernova can be written in the following way. Mu obs, where we have the contribution of the peak magnitude in the B band. We have also the uh, capital M that is the absolute magnitude. And we have also the correction of stretch and color as suggested by trip. Then we have also the correction given to the host galaxy mass and the biases correction applied by Skolnik et al. 2018. For our analysis, the sample that we choose to use is the Pantheon sample uh, that was also mentioned in the previous presentation. So that is a collection of 1048 spectroscopically confirmed supernovae 1A. The redshift range of this Pantheon sample runs from 0 to 2.26. In Scully Petal, uh, this Pantheon sample has been homogenized and corrected for selection biases and systematic effects. And uh, the, the values of uh, the mu obs are reported in their repository, and we will base this analysis on that stability values. Our approach um, is uh, um, fundamentally a binning division of this Pantheon sample. So after the ordering in redshift of the Pantheon sample, we divide it into three. 4, 20, and 40 equally populated bins of supernovae. These are ordered in redshift. For each bin, the best fit value of the Hubble constant then is estimated, and all of the values for each bin, for each selection of bins, are then fitted with this law according to this form here. So we have here that the H, H naught tilde is the, the local value of H naught at redshift equal to zero. And uh, we have the evolutionary coefficient alpha that is expressed here. This formula is really common in astrophysics when we deal with the evolution of, uh, of parameters or quantities. So um, uh, after uh, each bin is created, we perform a chi-square minimization. There is the definition of chi-square. We have also the delta mu is the vector given by the difference of the value mu observed and the value mu theoretical. We have then the covariance matrix given by Skolnik that is given by statistical and systematic contributions. First of all, we average the values of mu obs and uh, systematic contributions uh, according to the different model that uh, discuss the, the color population of supernovae. So the Gaia et al, the GTAN model, and the Cotard et al uh, 2011 model. So uh, once we average these values, since in principle we have no mm, reason to choose one over another, we uh, build then the sub vectors delta mu and the sub covariance matrices uh, C uh, through a customized code that extracts those binnings from the total Pantheon sample. After the chi square minimization, a Monte Carlo Markov chain approach is applied to each bin to draw the posterior distributions of each nut. 
we performed then a one dimensional analysis focusing on each knot for the two cosmological models that we considered. So the lambda CDM, the W0, WA CDM model. Um, then uh, for our approach, we consider the fiducial values, we fix the values of omega 0m and uh, the values of uh, uh, W0, WA according to the ones that are reported in Skolnik et al. Uh, paper, so in their, in their table. In the first case, uh, with the supernovae only for the lambda CDM, in the second case, uh, for the supernovae combined with the cosmic microwave background for the W0, WA parameterization. Uh, can you still uh, see the screen and hear me, right? Or is... Uh... Uh, what, yes. What do you mean? Uh, can you see? Can you? Uh, it's not blocked, right? Because I had some problems before. Can you still see and hear? Yes, when? we can. Okay, thank you. I was just uh, wondering. So um, here we have the results for the lambda CDM model. Uh, we calibrate the M value of new OBS uh, such that locally the value of each knot is a seventy-three point five kilometer per over second per megaparsec. This value is uh, compatible with the um, with all the local probes of H0, it is given by the shoes uh, uh, SH0ES uh, calibration. It is also compatible with the RISETAL 2019 value. We observe that for each selection of bins, so 3, 4, 20, and 40, the fitting gives a decreasing trend of H0 with the redshift. We also plot here, uh, I know it's a bit small, the, the value of the parameter alpha. Uh, as you can see with, the, with the, its discrepancy from zero. Indeed, tabulating these values, we have that the parameter alpha for the different bins selection, here you see the, um, the fitting parameters, so H0 and alpha, the, the discrepancy from zero of alpha, so alpha over sigma alpha is given in 2.0 uh, from 1.3 to 2.0 sigma. Here we have the values of M, the reference value for calibrations. And then uh, assuming that this trend uh, could be observed also to cosmological redshift, we uh, make um, an extrapolation of the h naught value following the, um, the, the equation that we saw in the previous slides. So this equation here, using the, the, the fitting parameters, we extrapolate to the redshift of the last scattering surveys. And surprisingly, we observe that the extrapolated value is compatible in one sigma with the value of the measurement by Planck. We also estimate the tension reduction according to the formula that we have written here. We consider Xi as the experimental quantity here. Xf is given by our model. So um, the difference between um, the local value of H0 and the one extrapolated. According to this uh, formula, we have this percentage of reduction for the uh, lambda CDM model for the tension of H0. Uh, nearly the same results are visible when we apply the W0, WA CDM model. So uh, also in this case, we have the extrapolation that is compatible in one sigma with the values of the cosmic microwave background. And we have also interesting percentages of a reduction for the tension. And here you can find all of the details concerning the, the fitting and the compatibility with zero of the alpha parameter that this time ranges from 1.2 to 1.9. Okay, I will go to the conclusions. Um, the observed trend of each knot with redshift uh, is uh, characterized by a value of alpha uh, that goes as 10 to the power of minus two. And uh, this may be due to the following reasons. First of all, we, we consider that the selection biases and the astrophysical effects of the observable of the Pantheon sample may be the reason behind this, uh, this slow uh, evolution of the h naught. For more details about the biases, I suggest to, to see the papers of Dinotti et al. 2013a, 2015b, 2017a, where it is um, really enlarged uh, about the, the contents, about the selection biases. And uh, there may be also another astrophysical reason that is the evolution of the stretch parameter as pointed out in the Nicolas et al. 2021 paper, since uh, they highlight how the Pantheon sample shows a slow drift of the stretch parameter with the redshift. Concerning the theoretical interpretations, if this trend then reveals not to be due to astrophysical biases and uh, evolutionary effects, then it may be necessary a new uh, theoretical scenario for describing the um, 
the, the gravitation also at local scales. As a proposal, and this is still a work in progress, we proposed the F of R theory in the Jordan frame with the, the, the action written in this form and the scalar field related to the F of R modified theory and the introduction of a Lagrangian density term for the matter source. Thank you for your attention and I will be glad to welcome comments or questions. Okay, Biagio, thank you very much for this interesting talk. Are there any questions? I have a comment that I would like to add. When we consider the uh, functional form, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Uh, so when we consider the functional form, uh, the function, maybe Biagio, you can put the slide of uh, H uh, tilde over one yes. plus Z to the power of alpha. So this function uh, is uh, usually used for, uh, for uh, GRBs or for quasars. And uh, one can use a parametrization that is more complex than this. But, uh, but since the supernova uh, 1A are observed up to redshift 2.26, then we didn't need to uh, uh, acquire more complex function that, for example, can be used for, for quasars. So this is the assumption behind the choice of this, uh, of this function. I just want to comment on that. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you for this comment. I also have one question. May I ask a question? Yes, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, there's a... Uh, there's a degeneracy de between Cobalt constant and absolute peak magnitude. Yes. And I ask how is it possible to constrain a Hubble, a Hubble constant for, for each divided redshift bins? Yeah, thank you for your important question. Indeed, there is a degeneracy between the H naught and the M value. So what we made as a preliminary analysis before the, um, the fitting of the different H naught value, we calibrated the, the M value locally. So we took uh, the first bin of each selection. So the first of the three bins, the first of four, the first of 20 and the first of 40. And we, we fixed the, the local value of H naught then extracting the fiducial value of M that is related to the fiducial to the to the value of H naught equal to 73.5. Then we used this value for each bin. So in our work, we assumed that the absolute magnitude does not evolve. And uh, then we observe the value of H naught. I hope that uh, this answers the question. Thank you. Thanks to you. And also, actually, we tried also with H0 equal to 70, and the results are, are actually independent from the initial value of the Hubble constant that we choose. Yes, thank you for the, also for pointing this comment out. OK. More questions? If not, let's thank the speaker again for this interesting thank talk. You. And we move on to the, our last speaker of this afternoon session, which is Tiziano Schiavone, who will talk on the evolution of inhomogeneous perturbations in the lambda CDM model and FR modified gravity theories. So Tiziano, please. Hello. Hello, everyone. Yes, hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, we can. Uh, do you see my screen? Yes, we do. OK. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, um, uh, thank you, uh, uh, organizer, for this uh, opportunity. Uh, I am Tiziano Schiavone from the University of Pisa. Uh, in this talk entitled uh, uh, On the Evolution of Inhomogeneous Perturbation in the Lambda CDM Model and F of R Modified Gravity Theories, we will focus on a possible way to distinguish between a cosmological constant scenario and extended gravity. This talk uh, is based on a work with uh, Giovanni Montani and the paper is uh, in preparation. First of all, I will briefly uh, recall some basic concepts of the standard lambda CDM model. Secondly, I will show uh, a well-known class uh, of modified gravity theories, the F of R extended models, regarded as a generalization of uh, the Einstein-Hilbert theory. 
I will talk also about the equivalent scalar tensor formalism in the Jordan frame. And I will present viable F of R models in cosmology. Then I will introduce uh, the lemaitre tolman bondi metric, LTB line element, which provides uh, um, a, a spherically symmetric uh, solution and describe uh, an inhomogeneous universe. Finally, I will follow a perturbation approach uh, considering inhomogeneities in the LTB metric as a small deviations from a homogeneous and isotropic universe in the FRW geometry. The whole point of, uh, of this work is to compare uh, lambda CDM and extended cosmological models to outline difference uh, different uh, uh, radial and time evolution of inhomogeneous perturbations. Let me start with uh, this introduction. Uh, the actual picture of the universe, uh, as you know, is basically based uh, on two concepts. Uh, uh, the first is uh, general relativity is the underlying gravitational theory behind the cosmological dynamics. The second is the cosmological principle namely the universe uh, appears homogeneous uh, and isotropic at large scales, approximately uh, greater than or equal uh, to 100 megaparsec. The FRW line element here on the top describes uh, this kind of geometry and the dynamics uh, is given by Friedman equations. Uh, once you know the matter, uh, uh, the matter distribution. More specifically, this, the second Friedman equation uh, uh, or the cosmic acceleration equation um, points out uh, uh, the need for uh, um, uh, a component with a negative pressure, uh, the dark energy, uh, to correctly take into account the acceleration phase. In particular, a cosmological constant uh, uh, lambda is consistent with uh, the dark energy properties with the equation of state parameter uh, W equal to minus one. The well-known uh, lambda CDM uh, cosmological model uh, is generally accepted uh, as the concordance model. It gives uh, a good fit uh, to most of the data, providing uh, a reliable scenario uh, of the present day uh, observ observed the universe. Uh, but uh, despite all uh, uh, the outstanding predictions and successes uh, to explain theoretically many observational facts uh, uh, in the universe, it is believed that uh, GR is not uh, a definitive uh, theory of gravity. The need of, uh, of uh, unknown components uh, as uh, CDM and dark energy could be uh, considered uh, a signal of the breakdown of GR at galactic or cosmological scale. Some open problems such as the cosmological constant, uh, the, co the coincidence problem, the fine tuning, the, the nature of the dark components, uh, the inflation, the H not tension, uh, have motivated people to look for some modification of the theory. Among many possibilities, special attention is paid in, in recent years to F of R gravity theories. These modifications uh, represent a particular class of modified gravity in which the, the scalar curvature R uh, in the gravitational Lagrangian density is replaced by um, an arbitrary function F of R, an extra scalar degree of freedom respect to GR, as you know. Uh, the extended field uh, equations uh, here on the bottom uh, are fourth order differential equations in the metric tensor components. Uh, and the interest in this class of th uh, gravity theories arises from the fact that uh, a geometrical modification or better the no Einsteinian terms uh, may be in, uh, in, um, interpreted as an effective matter source or fluid. In other words, there is no need to introduce uh, ad hoc dark energy or a, or a cosmological constant, but the current acceleration phase of the universe can be answered by a geometrical effect. Uh, I recall also that uh, it is often convenient uh, to reformulate F of our gravity in the scalar tensor representation in the Jordan frame using a dynamically equivalent gravitational action as shown uh, in this slide. The extra degree of freedom of, uh, given by the F of R function is converted into a non minimally uh, coupled scalar field potential, uh, V of phi, where the scalar field phi is coupled to the metric. The advantage uh, of this formalism is that uh, the corresponding field equations are now second order differential equations, even though the non minimally uh, coupling implies non trivial dynamics. But um, 
what kind of form for the f of r function? An f of r model to be viable uh, in cosmology should satisfy some properties to pass uh, local tests and also cosmological constraints. More specifically, it should uh, uh, mimic lambda CDM model in the high redshift regime where uh, it is well tested by the CMB. It should provide uh, um, an acceleration phase in the late universe without a true cosmological constant. And it should reduce to lambda CDM as a limiting case. Among several proposals for the functional form uh, of the F of R, uh, uh, here uh, you can find three, uh, three models that uh, are able to, to take into account all such properties to describe late time gravity modification the USA wiki model, the Starobinsky model, and Tsuchikawa models, which are very familiar to, to chair. Um, in this work, we focus on the USA wiki model, and the f of r function uh, is written here on the top, where uh, C1 and C2 are uh, parameters, and m squared is uh, related to the present matter density. It should be noted that uh, for r much bigger than m squared, uh, we have an effective cosmological constant uh, related to C1 and C2. Then we can constrain this, these two uh, parameters, uh, considering the lambda CDM model as a limiting case. Um, on the right uh, here on the top, uh, I've read the corresponding uh, scalar field potential in the Jordan frame. And uh, this is uh, the plot um, for, uh, for the potential where uh, one can see uh, a slow roll of the potential for, for decreasing values of phi. Now, uh, moving on to the spherically symmetric solution provided by the LMAT uh, Tolman Bondi metric. The LTB line element is written up here, uh, and it can be uh, considered as a, a generalization of the FRW metric in which the requirement of uh, homogeneity is dropped. The LTB uh, solutions uh, describe uh, uh, an inhomogeneous model of universe, for instance, uh, um, the evolution of uh, uh, a spherical uh, overdensity of pressureless dust. Uh, Not that uh, in an inhomogeneous uh, universe, all the physical quantities depend on T and uh, on uh, a radial uh, coordinate uh, R. Now we have uh, two new metric functions, alpha and beta. Uh, which depend on both time uh, and, uh, and R. Within the framework uh, of uh, GR, the Einstein field equation uh, zero 01 allows to determine a relation between alpha and beta. So adopting uh, uh, a particular parametrization here on the right, uh, we can rewrite the line uh, element in a form similar to FRW metric. But now we have a generalized sc uh, scale factor A which depend on T and R, and also um, uh, a function of radial coordinate, K square. In particular, if uh, A and, uh, and K square do not depend uh, on, uh, on R, then we, we rebuild exactly the uh, FRW metric for our homogeneous universe. This uh, reparameterization of the metric uh, simplifies uh, the Einstein field equations. And, and now the, the dynamics include, includes uh, uh, inhomogeneities. Uh, on the other hand, uh, in, in the metric uh, uh, F of R gravity in the Jordan frame, we have uh, different uh, dynamics since uh, we cannot rewrite the LTB metric in a simpler form. Uh, indeed, uh, the non-minimally coupling uh, between the scalar field and the metric affects uh, the zero one uh, Einstein uh, field equation. And we cannot find uh, a relation between alpha and beta like in GR scenario. Indeed, uh, you can see here this extra term due to uh, this non-minimal coupling. Uh, however, uh, not that the scalar, uh, the scalar field potential uh, does not appear in the zero one uh, field equation, but only in other, uh, in other field equations. For the sake of completeness, I write uh, all the field equations in the Jordan frame uh, adopting the LTB metric. Okay, uh, after uh, this overview, now let's move on the crucial part of this talk. We were inter uh, interested in finding uh, peculiar features of modified gravity to uh, trace uh, 
clear-cut distinctions with respect to GR, but, uh, how to compare uh, uh, lambda CDM and extended cosmological models. We decided uh, to investigate uh, the inhomogeneity's evolution using a, a perturbation approach. In doing so, we can evaluate the role of uh, a cosmological constant respect to the presence of the scalar field in the Jordan frame. So uh, we consider the LTB metric inhomogeneities as small deviations respect to a flat uh, FRW background metric. Um, we split uh, the metric functions, uh, the energy density and the scalar field um, into a background term denoted with uh, the bar plus uh, um, linear correction with the latter that depends on T and R. Moreover, uh, to study separately the evolution of these inhomogeneities in time and space, uh, we use a separation of variables method uh, at, a, at a linear order uh, of perturbation. So we define uh, time and radial functions for all linear perturbations. Then we analyze uh, the impact of such inhomogeneities studying the dynamics. The linearized uh, uh, field equations allow to investigate the different evolution of perturbations depending on the theory of gravity considered. Uh, regarding the lambda CDM model uh, at background level, we find an analytical solution uh, um, uh, uh, for the background. We observe that the background metric uh, functions alpha and beta are uh, related uh, at, to the background scale factor to reproduce uh, exactly the uh, FRW metric. We neglect uh, the radiation component in the late universe. Uh, omega zero uh, uh, R is the order of uh, 10 to minus five. Uh, we, re uh, we rewrite also the system in uh, a dimensionless uh, time variable tau uh, defined as T over T0, where T0 is the present cosmic time, roughly one over H naught, the Hubble constant. And we impose the, um, the condition that today uh, the scale factor is equal to, to, to one. Then the scale factor is described by, by this function, and this is the plot. The scale factor grows for increasing values of tau. Uh, moreover, we also plot uh, the deceleration parameter Q of tau. We note, uh, we note that uh, if uh, tau goes to infinity, then Q uh, goes to minus one, pointing out a dominant cosmological uh, constant term. Now, uh, we include linear uh, perturbations in the field equations, but the system now ca cannot be solved uh, analytically. So we solve uh, numerically the one, uh, one uh, Einstein equation with these initial conditions. Once you know the background uh, solution, a and this is the plot results. Note that uh, uh, the time part uh, of the perturbed scale factor increases as uh, tau grows. And this fact may be a problem if perturbations be uh, become uh, unstable. However, the perturbed scale factor is dominated by the background term at any time, at, um, at any times, at, at any tau. Um, indeed, uh, the ratio uh, eta of tau between uh, the, uh, perturbation and background term is always uh, much uh, smaller than one. In other words, small inhomogeneities will remain uh, small whatever the value of tau. Uh, concerning uh, the radial dependence of perturbations, we proceed similarly, considering the linearized field equations. We find that the radial uh, correction of the perturbed scale factor goes like uh, one over uh, R to three in GR. Inhomogeneities decay quickly at large scales according uh, to the cosmological principle. Now, uh, we repeat uh, uh, the same approach in the FVAR uh, modified gravity. We consider a background uh, uh, solution for the Husawiki model in the Jordan frame. We have to find a numerical solution uh, starting from uh, the extended field equations. Uh, we choose uh, the parameter of, of this model in such a way that uh, uh, we are very close to lambda CDM for the background order. 
This is the corresponding plot for the scale factor, and we cannot see differences with respect to the lambda CDM exact solution at, at the graphic level, and also for the deceleration parameter Q. Uh, in this slide, uh, we quantify the deviation from GR evaluating the, the, the scalar field. Note that the phi bar is exactly equal to one in GR limit. And we plot the quantity one min uh, minus phi bar of tau over uh, 10 to minus uh, seven. For tau uh, smaller than one uh, or, or positive redshift, we observe uh, smaller deviations from GR while deviations uh, are bigger in the late universe. Anyway, uh, the modified gravity dynamics at background is very close uh, to lambda CDM model. Now, uh, let, uh, let me move on, the, on to the linear perturbation theory in the Jordan frame. Uh, again, we st uh, study separately time and radial evolution of uh, inhomogeneous solutions, starting from uh, the linearized field equations. Uh, moreover, expanding the scalar field uh, potential and uh, its derivative respect to the background uh, uh, scalar field, which depend on, uh, uh, only on, on time, uh, it can be shown that the potential affects uh, only the time evolution of the linearized field equations. As I will show you in the uh, next slide, uh, we obtain an analytical solution for the radial part, whereas uh, we find uh, a numerical solution for the time evolution. So using the separation of variable method at first order of perturbation, we obtain uh, field equations only in R and field equations only in T. Finally, for the radial part, we have a Yukawa-like solution uh, for linear perturbations uh, of scalar field, energy density, and metric functions. Jordan frame gravity introduced a typical spatial scale uh, RC, uh, such that uh, for R much bigger than RC, inhomogeneities uh, decay faster than ones uh, in GR. It is important to stress that this result is completely independent of, of the choice of scalar field potential. So the solution uh, applies to any form of the F of R model. It is uh, a remarkable uh, feature of uh, the Jordan frame gravity, different from uh, the radial evolution in GR. Concerning the time evolution, here uh, the potential and uh, it, uh, its derivative uh, are involved in the lin linearized uh, field e equation. So the solution uh, depends uh, on the particular form of F of R. We solve uh, numerically the 0, 1 equation, the continuity equation, the scalar field equation to show that uh, the de density co uh, contrast uh, and in general in homogeneous perturbations remain smaller than background term for any uh, time tau. Uh, in conclusion, uh, we have seen uh, how inhomogeneities affect uh, the dynamics in the local universe, both in GR and F of R modified gravity theories. We considered uh, inhomogeneities in the LTB metric as a small deviations respect to uh, FRW geometry. And we analyze uh, separately the perturbations evolution in time and space for both cosmological models. We find a distinctive uh, uh, radial solutions in the Jordan frame gravity. Uh, this comparison between lambda CDM and um, modified gravity models through the investigation of uh, spatial inhomogeneities could become a qualitative uh, discrimination when incoming missions uh, like Euclid will be able to test uh, uh, the larger scale properties of the universe. This preliminary work offers uh, an, in an interesting arena to study the effects uh, on the photon propagation due to local deviations from homogeneity. Uh, thank you for the attention. And uh, this is my um, email and my contact. OK, Tiziano, thank you very much for this interesting talk. Are there any questions? I would like uh, to make a comment. Um, 
uh, just to stress that uh, with uh, Tiziano, that is a co-author of the paper that I showed in the previous uh, presentation. Uh, and then we are testing uh, further. The work in progress is on the HUSA wiki model. So I just wanted to comment about that. And we are testing if it can uh, explain the behavior of each NACT that we observed in the Pantheon sample. Thank you. And thank you, Tiziano, for the interesting talk. Thank you. Yes, we we uh, we are, uh, are trying to to test uh, uh, modified gravity theories uh, uh, in late time to uh, to solve on reduce the double constant tension and to explain uh, the uh, the possible evolution of double constant uh, in the previous uh, talk. Thank you. Okay. Another question or a comment. Well, if not, this concludes this uh, DE1 session. And I, I would like to thank again all the speakers for delivering very interesting talks. And bye-bye, uh, everybody. Thank you very much. OK, bye-bye. Thank bye. you. Bye, thank you. Yes, bye-bye. <laughs>